Okay, I'm seeing Perales, I'm not hearing him. Uh, City Clerk, I'm getting a text message from Council Member Esparza that they're unable to hear on okay. Zoom. That is not me. Okay, Perales, can you hear, can you hear me, now? me now? I can hear you now. Thank you. Okay, so starting over, I have Jimenez. Perales. Here. Here. Jimenez, Perales. Got it. Cohen. Cohen. Costco. Davis. Here. Esparza. Here. Arenas. Foley. Here. Mahan. Here. Jones. Present. Licardo. You have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it over to staff to kick off the meeting. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Lee Wilcox, Assistant City Manager. I want to welcome the council and members of the public to the special meeting. If we can get the presentation going, be great. Um, as we start, I want to do a few quick round of introductions. Joining me in the box today and part of the presentation is our city clerk, Tony Tabor, city auditor, Joy Royce, our director of administration, policy, and intergovernmental relations, Sarah Zarate, and assistant to the city manager, Michelle McGurk. I also want to start um, by thanking Fred Pereira, who's in the audience, which is the chair of the Charter Review Commission. And I want to give a special thanks to Michelle McGurk and Mark Vanny for uh, a lot of hours of work to get us um, here with these memorandum and, and this presentation and all the analysis that accompany, accompanies it. So thank you very much. On January 11th of this year, the council directed staff to return with a proposed ballot measure to change the timing of the mayoral election and further directed that staff schedule and facilitate a special meeting for the remaining charter review uh, commission recommendations for the purpose of prioritizing additional ballot questions for November 8th of 2022 or this year and providing additional direction from council on additional recommendations for further evaluation and implementation. It should be noted that the rules committee approved direction um, to separate out um, the recommendations from the charter review committee uh, specific to public safety, which will accompany or follow recommendations from uh, the reimagining group on public safety. And secondly, the expansion of municipal voting rights um, has been scheduled for April 29th and is being led by the city clerk. The city charter serves as the city's constitution. The first city charter was adopted in 1916 in 1965, a city charter commission produced the charter that is in effect today with larger changes happening in 1978 and 1986. Now in 2022, the council considers several recommendations from the commission. This special meeting has been designed to meet council direction, provide a research and analysis and provide a structure to help you as a council facilitate your own decision-making as you work through this. In our research of the recommendation, the city manager, city attorney, city clerk, and city, offer, uh, city auditor have offered information, important context for your decision-making, policy alternatives. And as we go into these policy alternatives, you'll see several layers of law and policy, starting first with our city charter, accompanied by possible ordinances that can follow um, or substitute or where you can meet the uh, intent of the commission's recommendations with council policies. So as we've worked through this, you'll hear those as part of the presentation. And as we go through the prioritization, um, Sarah will discuss how we're gonna discuss and prioritize this as I hand it over to her next in a second. I do wanna highlight something important from the staff memorandum is that the items selected today by the council for further evaluation and work will be brought forward to the prioritization of the city roadmap on May 16th with the council so that this work can be prioritized against the other critical work already directed by you as a council. We are doing this because it is important that the administration can focus over the next several months on our collective work 
and objectives are um, and the objectives of not only identifying work that needs to be done, but prioritizing it against everything else that we need to do as an organization, including our homeless emergency housing, our pandemic recovery and relief, police reforms work plan and community safety initiatives such as Vision Zero, federal and state advocacy to push our needs forward for the problems facing our residents and the other priorities approved in the mayor's March budget message by this council. With that, I'd like to turn the rest of the presentation over to Sarah Zarate. Thank you, Lee. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council, members of the public. My name is Sarah Zarate. I am the Director of the Office of Administration, Policy, and Intergovernmental Relations. As noted by Lee previously, today's presentation is but one piece of a three-part direction from Council on January 11th requesting analysis of recommendations offered by the Charter Review Commission. The city clerk already returned to council in February with a proposed ballot measure for June 7th to move the mayoral election to the same year as presidential elections beginning in 2024. And the third piece, a second study session is scheduled for April 29th to examine extending municipal voting eligibility to all city residents. On April 1st, several council appointees released memos providing the council implementation factors related to the 15 recommendations that included costs, policy alternatives, and other practical considerations. Today, we'll summarize the memo within the same context and provide the council with an additional discussion framework to further categorize and prioritize this work. Key guiding questions we pose for categorization include, is the recommendation an urgent matter that should be considered by voters this November? Can the core issue be addressed by a means other than a charter change and thereby give this and future councils more flexibility? Should the recommendation be explored further by a future charter review commission because of any complicating factors? Or though it may be a very worthy idea, should the recommendation be declined at this time? These questions are categorized into four buckets, now, next, later, and decline. Recommendations categorized in now require a charter amendment and will be included in a draft charter amendment for, November, for the November 8th, 2022 election. Those in next may or may not require a charter amendment, but likely require additional staffing, consultant help, additional policy work, additional resources, or significant community engagement. These will be placed on the list for consideration during the upcoming citywide roadmap exercise or may require other work to be considered for a future ballot measure. If in the later bucket, the recommendation will be referred to a future charter review commission or other future dates. If the recommendation is declined, it does not move forward through any additional process. The 15 recommendations we will review today span four categories, including governance, voting, inclusion and accountability, and other policy. Some require charter changes, while others have alternative implementation paths that could offer the council additional flexibility while meeting the intent of the recommendations. Lastly, others, for various reasons, may require considerable additional community engagement. And now I'll turn it back to Lee to begin our summary. Thank you, Sarah. So I'm starting with recommendation one uh, from the commission, which was to maintain a council manager government structure, but allow council members to make nominations for city manager. With the present form of government and the charter, the mayor is assigned duties beyond that of the council, including that the mayor shall nominate one or more candidates for consideration for the appointment to the position of city manager. It does not specify this for other council appointees, however. The commission stated that the purpose of this recommendation was to provide more equitable representation in the applicant pool for city manager. However, past and current practices in the city have often had the mayor informing the council through closed session and seeking feedback, not only on the process, but the selection of candidates to be brought forward and interviewed by the full council. 
In my own examples, having worked in the mayor's office, this has happened with at least two city manager searches and two independent police auditor searches within the last six years. In addition, best practices in human resources and recruiting dictate that it is essential to have a clear recruitment process for employees. As recommended by the commission now, multiple recruitments could cause confusion for candidates, the organization, and for the council as a whole. If the council wishes to change the current approach, council could revisit this um, through council policy versus changing it uh, through the charter, allowing greater time into research and more flexibility and possibly include all council appointees if a council policy were to be passed. Moving on to recommendation two from the commission. Um, that it states um, establishing future charter review commissions be put into the city charter. Currently, the charter allows the council to convene a charter review commission at any time that it deems necessary. However, by adding a mandate in the charter, it does tie the council's hands at those intervals with this requirement, void of any context or circumstance um, at that time, such as need, budget, or existing priorities that the organization is facing. Um, because of this, we would think that if council would like to move forward, you could address through other means. But again, council has the ability to appoint such a commission at any time. With that, I'll pass the rest to Michelle. Good afternoon, um, council members. I'm, uh, I'm Vice Mayor. I'm Michelle McGurk, Assistant to the City Manager. Um, and I'm pleased to uh, talk to you briefly about recommendation number three, which is to expand the city council to 14 council districts. The um, Charter Review Commission stated that they wanted to bring the number of um, residents per district um, to a ratio that was in line with where things were at in 1980 when the council was expanded to its current size of 10 members plus the mayor. At that time, there were about 63,000 uh, residents per district. However, looking back at the history, we did discover council members that at that point in time had a budget of about $50,000 $50, and one aid per district. Um, as outlined in the staff report, we looked at the 20 largest cities in the US to see where San Jose fits in terms of council size and ratio of residents, as well as to look at what other folks were doing um, with, the with their population changes from the 2020 census. Um, the average number of residents per district um, currently is 106,000 in this list of the top 20 cities. And San Jose currently has a, a rough estimate of 101,000 uh, residents per district. Ongoing costs are currently $1 million per year per district. And one-time costs to implement this um, proposed change including redistricting and reconfiguring City Hall and the council chambers, including the dais, which doesn't seat 14 members, um, are estimated at a minimum of $2.5 million in one-time costs. When we looked at other major cities that are expanding their council sizes, two examples emerged, both Fort Worth, Texas and Columbus, Ohio um, are currently undergoing an expansion but they timed their expansion and redistricting efforts to the 2020 census and their next election cycles, which is actually in 2023. Um, one policy alternative would be to revisit this issue in the future, given that San Jose just went through redistricting um, this past uh, cycle. And it is important to note that the earliest that we could fully implement this recommendation would be the 2026 election cycle when council members who are elected this year will either term out or be eligible for re-election. So with that, we'll turn it over to Tony Tabor, city clerk for recommendation number four. Good afternoon, council and vice mayor. My name is Tony Tabor, city clerk. The recommendation four from the Charter View Commission is to implement ranked choice voting. Rank choice voting is an election method that allows voters to rank their preferences for candidate races on one ballot, eliminating the need for a separate runoff election. Um, for that reason, it's also called instant runoff voting. 
The benefits of ranked choice voting include cost savings from el eliminating an election, reduced negative campaigning, and promoting diversity on the city council. Challenges include voter education, the effect on other ballot items, such as the timing of general tax measures, which must be consolidated with the regularly scheduled general election for members of the governing body. Several Bay Area jurisdictions currently allow for ranked choice voting, such as San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, and San Leandro. In an off agenda memo released on March 4th, the County of Santa Clara Registrar of Voters notes it would take, it would need 12 to 16 months to complete all necessary due diligence and develop and execute an implementation plan after a decision is made. An alternative for the city council is to wait to implement ranked choice voting for the decision of the County of Santa Clara Board of Supervisors on their own elections. Next slide. A recommendation five from the Charter Review Commission is to elevate the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices to the city charter along with Planning Commission, Salary Setting, and the Civil Service Commission. Currently, the BFCPP is codified in the Municipal Code. Therefore, the City Council can make changes to its scope at any Council meeting through passing an ordinance allowing the Council flexibility. Eliminating the Commission to the Charter level will require a ballot measure to approve and a ballot measure to make future changes to the scope or any other changes to the BFCPP. I'm um, turning this back to Michelle McGurk. All right, um, council members, um, recommendation six is um, a bit complicated. It has three parts around making changes to reform boards and commissions. Part A recommends allowing non-citizens to serve on boards and commissions. Currently, the three charter commissions, the Planning Commission, the Civil Service Commission, and the Salary Setting Commission require members to be registered voters in San Jose. Um, Changing this requirement would require a charter change. Additionally, the municipal code requires the members of the Board of Fair Campaigns and Political Practices to be registered voters. All other boards and commissions, um, which are enacted by ordinance, uh, do not have citizenship or voter registration requirements. Part B of recommendation six recommends additional training for commissioners in a number of areas. Um, this will require time to implement as we discussed in the report, given that there are more than 20 boards and commissions and approximately 239 commissioners. Um, part C recommends paying stipends to commissioners. Um, and a few of our commissions currently do that, such as the planning commission and um, the retirement boards and a few others as discussed in the report. At $250 per month, which is what planning commissioners currently receive, um, this uh, recommendation would total approximately $597,500 to cover all boards and commissions. This is not required to be done um, by a charter amendment. However, um, a charter amendment would make it permanent versus um, putting it in the municipal. Um, so with that, we'll go to recommendation seven, which is to add a native land acknowledgement to the city charter. Adopting a native land acknowledgement, whether within the charter or in other elements of the city's work, as we discuss in our report, would build upon the steps that the city of San Jose has already taken to acknowledge and honor the history and experiences of Native Americans in San Jose. Um, beginning with our recognition of Indigenous Peoples Day as a city holiday. Um, staff appreciates the Charter Review Commission's engagement with the community and with the Muwekma Ohlone tribe to develop the draft Native Land Acknowledgement. However, concerns arose near the end of the Commission's meeting process with testimony from other tribal stakeholders who had not been included in the development of the Land Acknowledgement. Um, best practices for the development of such acknowledgements require significant community engagement, particularly with various native and tribal groups, preferably facilitated by a third party to ensure that genuine efforts around meaningful dialogue, healing, reconciliation, and trust building between those who have been impacted 
and the government entity. Any draft and final land acknowledgement would then need to go through in-depth review from tribal groups to ensure agreement. Staff looked at the 10 largest cities in California, as well as entities such as San Jose State University, and found a variety of approaches to honoring and acknowledging um, local tribal groups and their history and experiences, um, as we discussed in the staff report. This work is important and staff recommends a thoughtful approach. So recommendation eight is to update gendered language in the city charter and other city documents. City staff is in the process of working to make city documents gender inclusive and gender neutral. If council chooses to place a charter amendment on the November 2022 ballot or on another future ballot, we can update the charter language to be gender neutral at that time. And now with that, we'll turn it over to Sarah for recommendations nine and 10. Recommendation nine is a detailed three-part recommendation. Part A adds a statement of values to the charter that defines social equity, inclusion, and racial and social justice as guiding principles for the decisions, policies, budgets, programs, and practices of the city. Part B outlines objectives intended to advance the values through the areas of safety, environmental health, water and sanitation, parks and recreation, mobility and transportation, economic development, housing standards, workforce protection, and housing amenities. Part C requires that an equity assessment be conducted for the annual operating and capital budgets as contained in the recommended budgets generated by the city manager each fiscal year and for major policies and programs to be decided upon by the city council. This latter piece can be triggered by a majority vote of the city council or by a submission of a petition with at least 2,500 signatures from city residents. And it also outlines very specific elements that must be included in the assessment. Making these changes in the charter would require approval by the voters. If desired, however, other options are available, including, for example, a council policy, ordinance, or resolution. This was noted in the commission report. Regardless of method chosen, if this recommendation moves forward, additional, more robust community engagement is recommended, similar to that followed for the racial equity definition to ensure that the values and standards proposed reflect the community voices of those most historically and currently marginalized or disadvantaged. Importantly, this recommendation builds on existing work as the city is currently undertaking significant work to address racial equity as described in the accompanying staff memo with much more planned and being rolled out in the coming fiscal year. If the council were to pursue a policy alternative to achieve the pace des desired by the commission, the work would require staff time and resources to engage the administration, departments, elected officials, and most importantly, our community. And it would need to be evaluated as part of the future budget process. Recommendation 10 builds on the previous recommendation by further aligning department statements of policy and city budgeting processes with the values, standards, and equity assessments of recommendation nine. As noted in the commission report, legal research would be required to ensure there are no legal barriers to implementing this recommendation. Similar to recommendation nine, if a charter change is pursued, it would require approval by the voters. The same policy alternatives are also true. As stated for recommendation nine, the city has been progressively increasing explicit consideration of equity into its service delivery and budget approach. This was specifically seen in the allocations from the Coronavirus Relief Fund and the American Rescue Plan Fund, targeting support to the community's most vulnerable and disproportionately impacted residents. 
The 2022-2023 budget balancing strategy guidelines also require the administration to pose explicit considerations of equity, including who benefits and who is burdened when considering changes to city services. To operationalize this approach, the Office of Racial Equity and the City Manager's Budget Office have developed a budgeting for equity worksheet as a tool for depart departments to apply equity lenses. Of course, much more capacity building is necessary to fully scale this approach. And again, if the council were to pursue a policy alternative at a more aggressive pace, the work may require additional staff time and resources as previously mentioned. And now I'll turn it over to our city auditor, Joe Royce. Good afternoon, Joe Royce, city auditor. Recommendation 11 is to mandate regular department-wide audits. Without a significant increase in ongoing audit resources, adding mandated regular department-wide performance audits to the city auditor's work plan would severely impact the office's ability to conduct performance audits identified through our regular risk-based process. As a result, the proposal risks focusing limited audit resources on areas where, areas where they do not add the greatest value to the residents of San Jose. I do want to note, this was noted in, in the, uh, the final commission report. Also, because of the size and scope of services of the city's departments, and because services are often coordinated across departments, a large scope department-wide audit would carry great audit risk, or the likelihood we would not identify areas for improvement within a program or service in the context of the many different performance aspects of our city departments. Lastly, no other performance audit office in California or other large cities that we surveyed conduct department-wide audits like that described in the Charter Commission's proposal. In summary, however well-intentioned the recommendation is, there's a great risk that the proposal would weaken rather than strengthen the audit function in the city. For these reasons, I recommend Council does not move forward with the proposal as summarized in the memo that I've submitted. I'll now turn it back to Michelle. All right, council members, the Charter Review Commission had four additional policy recommendations that are not related to the city charter. We refer to these as the other policy recommendations. The first is to create a 17 member climate action commission. The Environmental Services Department and San Jose Clean Energy have reviewed this proposal and recommend that if council wishes to move forward in exploring this, that rather than creating a new commission, you could expand the scope of the existing San Jose Clean Energy Advisory Commission. And as our report notes, at the proposed size of 17 members, this would be one of the largest city commissions and would require additional staffing to manage the workload. If you wish to move forward, we could explore this further in a manager's budget agenda during the budget process that's upcoming. So, Recommendation 13 is to explore a Community Opportunity to Purchase Act. This work is already on the Housing Department work plan as discussed in the staff report. No action is required as the City Council already endorsed this work with your approval of the Housing Crisis Work Plan and the 2020 Citywide Resident Residential Anti-Displacement Strategy. However, if the Council wished to formally endorse the Commission's recommendation, you could do so. And recommendation 14 is to explore new policies to support the purchase of affordable housing by low income San Jose residents while not impacting existing policies or resources available to support affordable rental housing for its residents. The staff report discusses how the housing department is already addressing this work and again, like recommendation 13, no action is required as the city council already has endorsed this policy work um, with your approval of the housing crisis work plan. However, if you wish to formally endorse the commission's recommendation, that is action you could take. And so finally, we are at recommendation 15, which is to expand membership on the Smart City Advisory Board to include neighborhood representatives and nonprofits. The staff report provides a status update on the various boards that have been convened around IT and innovation issues in recent years, including the Smart City Advisory Board, and provides some information about how this work could be expanded. 
or as an alternative, given the large number of neighborhoods and neighborhood associations in San Jose, one uh, potential alternative would be to ask the Neighborhoods Commission to designate a member to serve as a liaison to these um, innovation bodies. Another alternative would be for the um, IT and innovation teams to engage with the Neighborhoods Commission via an annual verbal report or when there is a matter pending that needs broader neighborhood input. So with that, this concludes staff presentation and the next step is to hear public comment. Thank you staff for that presentation. Uh, Tony will now take public comment. Just checking for in-person cards. My first speaker is Tessa Woodmancy. Hello, you can hear me? Yes. Okay, good, thank you. Yeah, I'm commenting on our only thing that we should all be talking about, which is our climate crisis. And the idea of not um, creating, I don't have a two minute thing. Um, so um, basically, uh, thank you. Um, you know, well, the, you know, your environmental services who have not been effective because, you know, as the science has just reported to us in the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, you know, we are in a crisis that needs, you know, we need to be reducing our fossil fuel use by half by 2025 and by zero by 2030. So this is a degrowth program that needs to be implemented and nobody is implementing it. And that is why we are going to have, they say, a half, a half of humanity will not be able to adapt. That's 4 billion people to the crisis that's happening, the climate crisis that's happening now. And as we're seeing around our world right now in the Southeast and in the, um, you know, they're having so many storms that are really impacting us. So this is where we're having climate change and we're not making the changes. And so to say that, you know, we need to put it into a, um, a city, um, you know, thing about clean energy. It's not only about clean energy, it's degrowth. How we have to, like, like um, Marshall Woodman C is saying, that we need to look at, we need to make San Jose a food garden again and keep fossil fuels in the ground. Because that is what the science says. That's what his father, who has been advising us about our climate crisis as a biologist and climate scientist, keep it in the ground. That is how we need to go forward. And from there, we can make the decisions. And then whether or not this 17 um, people body, they have to understand the science, which is to keep it in the ground. And we move forward from there and make decisions about how we go forward from keeping it in the ground, that we have no fossil fuel budget left and we must change. Call in user two. Yeah, thanks for thanks for taking my call. Uh, well, I appreciate all all the hard work you people do down there, at City Hall. It's just amazing what you you know what you guys need to do. Pat yourself on the back and I'll clap for all the hard work you people do down there. It's just amazing what you're doing. And I'll tell you what, I like this uh, proposal for the Native American people, and I'll tell you why. Because the next step is to bulldoze City Hall and build, build those beautiful Thule domed huts that the Native American people built out of the stuff uh, from the ground. You know, Tess, Tessa Woodnancy would like this. You know, the Thule's and redwood bark. It would definitely be an improvement to the eyesore of that Death Star. I mean, you walk in that building, you want to blow your brains out. It's so horrible. It's so depressing to look at, to walk in and out of. You think you're going into some, like, science fiction movie where you're going to be tortured or something bring back the native american architecture and and ways of city hall put that that uh, city hall to the earth make it just dirt and let's start over with those tule huts that would be so much better and while we're at it get rid of the city council bring in the tribal council then we're going to get back to the, we're going to get back to basics here in san jose thanks a lot David Holtzman. Uh, greetings, San Jose. 
uh, council members. Nice to be able to speak to you. Uh, and thank you for going through a charter review commission process. I've uh, been through a few of them in the past. Um, my name is David Holtzman and I am a former president, uh, believe it or not, of the League of Women Voters of Los Angeles. And I can tell you that um, while I was involved with the league, I had a nice time in San Jose uh, because we had a statewide League of Women Voters convention there. So I am dialing in, zooming in to remind you that the League of Women Voters advocates ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting, um, largely because it would increase the amount of fairness and freedom for voters in elections. So um, I will tell you, like the previous comment, I really appreciate uh, your apparent uh, commitment to civic engagement there. I had a very nice tour as part of the league convention from Ash Calver there of your city hall. I see no need to demolish it, <laughs> um, but I do see, uh, I do appreciate your commitment to civic engagement. And um, I can only tell you that um, a little more freedom and fairness for voters through ranked choice voters, uh, through ranked choice voting or instant run voting um, would only uh, strengthen your commitment to civic engagement. So again, thank you for your time. And uh, thank you for considering this recommendation. Um, really appreciate it. Robert Brownstein. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to speak um, in support of the proposal regarding equity values, equity standards, and um, an equity process for major policy um, issues. A proposal like this really demonstrates the flaws in the methodology that city staff is using in evaluating these proposals. Because the most urgent category you have is now. And this proposal is decades overdue, decades overdue to finally place inclusivity and equity at the forefront of the values that the city holds and incorporating them into the charter. Also, the methodology has a section that talks about funding that's needed in order to implement the measure. But there's no section that talks about the costs of failing to put this in the charter. The costs of having families continue to be second-class residents of San Jose, of families continuing to not receive equitable services as people in other parts of the city receive. The costs of a younger generation once again seeing that there are reasons, there are always reasons why equity should be put on the shelf and should not be treated as a priority. Also, there's a, a, a thrust in the staff recommendations that emphasizes the value of flexibility. But the fact is, when you're talking about a measure that assures that certain people will not be considered continually second-class residents of this city, flexibility is not a virtue. What we need is finally language in the charter that affirms both the values and the standards of inclusiveness and equity, and we simply can't do it fast enough. Thank you for listening. Rebecca Gallardo. Hello, thank you. I am a resident of district number three and I'm coming to express support for the recommendation to adopt ranked rank choice voting for San Jose. I think uh, one of the biggest benefits of ranked choice voting is that we the, this type of voting will reduce the racial turnout gap and uh, the people that show up in primary elections are substantially different from the people who show up from the this for, for the general election. And so drug choice voting by allowing us to 
remove the usage of the primary elections and just go to the much higher turnout, general election will increase voter representation a lot for our city. It's, uh, it's a system that has been tried by other cities and other states, and it works perfectly everywhere. And so I heard completely support uh, the implementation of this, and I hope the council will adopt this. Thank you very much. Maria Fuentes, come on down. This is not the price is right, though. I realized as soon as I said it. Just go straight to the microphone. Good afternoon. Is it on? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm Maria Fuentes, and I'm one of the members of the Charter Review Commission. There are others who are now listening, um, and I'm not sure if anybody else is going to be speaking, but um, I would like to appreciate some of the comments that were made by the public, and particularly um, uh, Robert Brown Brownstein, um, because I hope that all of you will really take what we have recommended seriously. Um, I appreciate all the comments that were made by staff and the analysis that has been done. It would have been helpful to have this information so that maybe we could have commented. As you know, our commission is no longer um, in existence. Um, but I just want to really emphasize to please take our, all of our recommendations seriously. Um, in spite of some of the comments that are made that, you know, maybe we don't need to do this, we're already doing it, this is duplication. Um, trust me that we did not look at it that way. We feel that what we put on there as recommendations, and please note how unanimously our work was voted upon. You know, just about every recommendation was approved unanimously by a very diverse, uh, commission that you appointed. So please consider how strongly we feel about what we're recommending and please consider adopting everything we recommended or at least ask us for more information or see how you can go as closely as possible to our recommendations. It is truly about the future of our city. As uh, Bob Brownstein pointed out, there is not equity here. People are suffering here. The opportunity that used to be in San Jose, many years ago that many people have been able to benefit from is no longer here. And so we are trying as much as we can to see how our city can, can really make a difference and, and change course. Equity was our main theme. And I think all of you know why that is so. So thank you. Thank you. I'm Corinna Herrera-Laura. Yes, hello, my name is Corina Herrera Loera. I am a resident of District 5. I'm a member of Calpulito Naleque and also serve my community as a school board member for the Alum Rock Union Elementary School District. In addition, I am, as a descendant of the Wiradikan Huichol Nation, an active member of the local indigenous community. I am here to urge and ask for your support uh, to support all the recommendations put forth by the Charter Review. I can assure you they did long, extensive um, interviews, invitations to the local community to ensure that our voice uh, was heard. Um, I ask you to take on and vote to amend the Charter to include a Native land acknowledgement and support also the non-citizens to be able to serve on city boards um, as well as all the other recommendations put forth by uh, this charter review. Um, I am available for any um, additional questions, comments, also as a local Native Indigenous person um, that has a longstanding relationship with the Moak Maloney uh, leadership, especially Charlie Nishme, and we've been working um, and collaborating with our local Indigenous people here of this land. Um, thank you so much. Alina. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I am in support of um, all of the proposals uh, one through 15, and particularly I wanna speak in support of um, reforming boards and commissions. We wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the will of the people to have a democratic process when it comes to lawmaking. Um, I'd also like to add that in regards to citizenship, 
The, the move would also align with Senate Bill 225 at the state level that has removed citizenship requirements for all state boards and commissions. I think this is particularly important when we think about, for example, the Planning Commission and certain decisions like the flea market. What would that have looked like if there was more broad representation um, regarding decisions that really impacted a lot of our in undocumented communities? I think this policy would greatly increase civic participation within our boards and commission, which currently has an annual vacancy of 40 to 60 seats a year. By investing in the infrastructure of boards and commissions, we can take a collective action to improve civic participation across so many facets of our government. I also support committing to climate action, either through a new or combined with pre-existing commission, but it must have resident seat participation. I support the equity values as shared by Bob Brownstein. And lastly, um, you know, we are discussing here today is, I think it's nothing short of amazing and historic. And I trust that the people of San Jose, you know, can come together to review the charter every 10 years. This is what is the most equitable and inclusive and it affirms that council values our input and they are creating intentional room and process to enable that through a charter review commission. And Again, we're discussing so many historic and amazing things right now, and it wouldn't be that way if we didn't have this commission. And I think that the people of San Jose deserve to be able to look at the, the guiding principles in this really important document every 10 years. Thank you. Elizabeth? Hello, uh, my name is Elizabeth Barcelos. I am a lifelong resident of San Jose for over 35 years and a resident of District 6. I'm calling in to express my support for the recommendation from Council Members Cohen and Jimenez to put forward a ballot measure on implementing ranked choice voting in San Jose. This reform will simplify our elections, increase voter turnout across all communities, and improve representation at City Hall. Currently, San Jose's poorly attended primary election, elections exacerbate a racial turnout gap. Among voters of color, this doubles in the general election, while white turnout increases by only 1.5 times. The result of these turnout disparities is that white voters make up a larger portion of the population in the electorate and primary elections than they do in general elections, therefore dictating who we get to vote for in the general election. Adopting ranked choice voting would be a significant step towards closing this turnout gap and instead holding a single round of elections in November when no candidates will face a larger and more diverse electorate. I hope that City Council report supports this charter uh, commission recommendation as well as all the others. Um, but this one specifically as a standalone bed ballot measure. We must work together to remove every barrier possible to a political participation in order to have the highest level of democracy possible. Thanks. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman. Uh, thanks for the meeting today. Uh, I guess to start off, a reminder, for better or for worse, that we have a really important commission a report on the future of the commission process coming out in June that, uh, for better or for worse, hopefully can navigate your decision making today. Of course, I'm for uh, more openness and accountability with technology and how the public can be involved with that process. It's really important to me. Uh, a neighborhood commission process is interesting and nice. Um, I think I'm looking for just a bit more and what can be, a, how we can further the concepts of direct contact between community and government in the in how to build the future of a community technology and surveillance and data collection. It is a hand in hand relationship uh, that we'll be walking through together in the next few decades that I, I just hope we just know how to grow. It'll just feel good to grow basically. Good luck how we can do that. Openness is important. Um, I guess I wanted to, uh, what else did I wanted to offer? I know about, uh, there's such a, a good body of work with this. Oh yeah, the, the auditing process. Uh, the auditor did not agree on what could be good. Uh, I, I think there needs to be a, a consideration of, of, uh, of a people's auditing idea where, where the community can be involved in the future of the auditing process, how that develops, Good luck. Uh, that, but this is a whole sort of process we're working on here. How can community be a more part of the government process and not the other way around uh, where it's dictates from our government? Uh, to conclude, uh, good luck how, with all the good thought we have going today. 
how we can talk about the future of policing and, and the good commissions that can help government with policing. Hui Tran. Uh, good afternoon, council members. This is Hui Tran. I was appointed by council member David Cohen to serve on the uh, Charter Review Commission, and I appreciated the opportunity to do this important work. Uh, I come here to speak specifically in support of the recommendation to adopt right choice voting. Uh, I know that staff is recommending that way to, to wait to see how the county plays this out, but um, how it plays out on the county level, uh, I don't really think that ties into how it uh, gets implemented here at the city level. I mean, the county is going to be administering it uh, regardless, and the recommendation did build in a bit of time for us to, uh, to, to make sure that the system works out well before it, get, it gets implemented. So uh, I would urge the council to uh, adopt the recommendation and put forth, excuse me, put forward ranked choice voting to the voters. Um, I would also uh, bring attention uh, to the recommendation to elevate the fair campaigns uh, board. Um, that discussion actually came with other recommendations uh, that included shifting some of the responsibilities, giving it a bit more authority as well. Uh, and I think that was important because there was discussions around how we as a city can address campaign finance reform. Uh, and to do that, we needed some kind of infrastructure that had that ability to do the oversight. Um, the, so I do think that if there, uh, to the extent that we can uh, have that conversation and, and look at what other abilities and powers can be uh, afforded to the Fair Campaigns Board to ensure that kind of uh, uh, enforcement and oversight of campaign finance and just campaigns in general, um, we thought that was important to, to look at. Uh, so it's not a standalone elevating the Fair Campaign Board as is, but look, to look at what we can get, what powers and authorities we can give to the Fair Campaign Board so that candidates uh, um, you know, work to try to follow the rules and that there's some mechanism to ensure that the campaign rules are followed. Uh, thanks to all and appreciate it. Nassim Nouri. Hi, thank you. My name is Nassim Nouri and I'm calling today on behalf of the Green Party of Santa Clara County in strong support of implementing ranked choice voting in San Jose through a standalone ballot measure. Ranked choice voting has been in the Green Party's platform since our inception because it is more democratic, it is more fair, and actually results in better turnout and most importantly, better representation of the voting population of San Jose. Ranked choice voting has proven itself to be simple to understand and after being implemented in many sitting, uh, cities across the country, it's actually made it clear that it does result in better representation. I am also a resident of District 4. I want to express my thanks to both Council Member Cohen and Jimenez for putting forward this memo. I do urge the Council um, for uh, to actually support this commission's recommendation. There are amazing recommendations that the, that the commission has come up with. And uh, in particular, I also want to urge the council to push forward to the next steps. The uh, community opportunity to purchase act housing is an incredibly important uh, crisis right now in our city. And that is one way to ensure that displacement is kept at bay. Thank you very much. Please support these recommendations. There is a lot of work that's gone into it with an amazing effort in getting community information and uh, participation in these recommendations. Thank you. Sandra. Thank you. Thank you to the city clerk and the staff who worked with the Charter Commission, the commissioners and the city staff that have worked on the pre presentation material. As you consider the items to bring forward for public vote, I request that the wording of any and all ballot measures be transparent, clear, and concise. Text and titling should avoid the pitfalls that we have seen recently in the ballot measures adopted by Valley Water. In my personal opinion, ranked choice voting will allow representation on the council by people who did not receive a majority of the first choice votes. Additionally, the cost of this recommendation needs to be considered. We are not adequately funding city core services such as safety, roads, libraries, and others. And there have been issues in other locations such as New York City. The racial equity proposal should not be in the charter as conditions change. And as noted in public comment and written comment, the current definition is flawed. We should work on it at the level it is now and not enshrine it in the charter. 
Again, I want to thank everyone who has worked on these issues, examined them, and appreciate the time of the staff that have worked on these issues. Thank you. Caller 9196. Press star six. There you go. My name is Pat Lang. Um, I'm calling in favor of ranked choice voting. And the reason I think it's a good idea is because it's easier for voters to understand how to pick what they really want. And a lot of effort seems to go into strategizing how you should place your vote. But ranked choice voting, voting makes it quite simple. You have a first choice, and if you don't, if that person doesn't win, you get to say who you hope second choice is or third choice. So it's just easier to get across the message you're trying to get across. And I believe it also reduces negative campaigning. So I'm encouraging you to uh, have ranked choice voting on the ballot measure. Thank you. Stephen. Hi there, thank you so much. <clears throat> Um, my name is Stephen Crane, and I'm a research scholar at Stanford, and I'm also calling to express my support for the recommendation from council members Cohen and Jimenez to put forward a ballot measure on implementing ranked choice voting in San Jose, and I've been very heartened to hear so many voices in support of that as well. And I believe this reform will simplify our elections, increase voter turnout across all communities, and improve representation at City Hall. And while ranked choice voting would be new for San Jose, we do have the benefit of many years of data from more than 40 US cities, demonstrating that this is a reform that voters both understand and prefer by and large. Um, nearly two decades ago, after their first ranked choice voting, 87% of voters in San Francisco said they understood it very well. And similarly, last year in New York City, 95% of voters found it simple to complete. It's worth pointing out that this level of understanding was consistent across all subgroups. So this shows that everyone is capable of understanding ranked choice voting. I hope that the city council supports this commission recommendation as a standalone ballot measure. We must work together to remove every possible barrier to pro political participation in order to facilitate the highest levels of democratic representation. Thank you very much. Carol Watts. Well, thank you. My name is Carol Watts and I'm president of the League of Voters of San Jose, Santa Clara. And uh, the league uh, has several positions that talk about how we present uh, about voting. And number one, that the language should be precise, clear, understandable, and meet standards of readability. And that there should only be a single subject on ballot measures. Why? Because then a voter can vote yes on one subject and no on another. Other positions that we have include maximizing effective voting and minimizing wasted voting. Also, we want to promote sincere voting over strategic voting. We thank you so much for establishing the Charter Review Commission and for considering all of these recommendations. Our members are following this discussion today and we are going to continue to follow it through all of the rest of your meetings. Thank you very much. Jeremy Bruce. Hi, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. This is Jeremy Barus, and I had the distinct pleasure and honor to serve as a commissioner on the San Jose Charter Review Commission in 2021. I just strongly urge the Council to consider the recommendations put forth by the Commission, like my fellow commissioners Tran and Fuentes had shared. The Commission had put dozens and dozens of hours into researching, into meeting with various subcommittees, bringing in guest speakers, talking to city staff, talking to experts to help form and shape these recommendations that we've put forth. So I strongly urge that you consider them. There's a lot of time and effort and research and studies that were put into this. I uh, also want to uplift um, Council Members Jimenez and Coins, 
uh, memo um, supporting ranked choice void voting. And uh, just want to thank you for your time today. Thank you. Heidi Riley. Hi, um, thank you so much for giving me the time to speak today. And thank you for considering ranked choice voting. Um, that's something I'm very passionate about. And I am really glad to see um, that it is something being considered right now for San Jose, which could be very influential seeing as it's such a big city. Um, ranked choice voting has a really strong track record of helping women candidates break through structural barriers and get elected. Um, recent ranked choice voting success stories have come in New York City, which just elected its first ever majority female city council, and in Las Cruces, New Mexico, which elected an all women city council for the first time in its history. Um, nearly half of all mayoral positions and city council seats decided by ranked choice voting are held by women. Put simply, electoral outcomes for women are better in places that have implemented ranked choice voting. So I hope the city council supports this commission recommendation as a standalone ballot measure, because um, we must work together to keep removing all the barriers to political participation. And you know, let's get the best democratic representation possible. And I urge you to put this out there for the voters to decide. Thank you so much. Gloria Gomez. Jorge Tuhi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Jorge Tuhi, my name is Gloria Gomez and I'm a member of the Moet Maloney tribe, the Aboriginal tribe, of the San Francisco Bay area, which includes the city of San Jose. And I'm asking the city council to vote to amend the charter to include the native land acknowledgement, specifically acknowledging the Moet Maloney tribe. We've submitted the land acknowledgement uh, that we are requesting to be placed in the charter and are willing to work with the uh, charter um, to revise anything, uh, but we definitely want our tribe uh, included in that. Also, the Moekmoni tribe agrees that there needs to be a climate change commission comprised of San Jose residents, and our tribe would gladly accept to have two seats on this commission. Thank you, Kishore Chekina. Kat Woodmancy. Unmute. Yeah, hello. So, um, commenting on the uh, handling and the, of the Climate Crisis Commission, how that's being rolled into an existing city department. Um, I, th I think this misses an opportunity to recognize that uh, this isn't, you know, how we handle the coming crisis, the existential crisis that humanity is being spun into. It's really not a departmental level approach, uh, decision. Um, you know, we, we really should be on a war footing. I, I know that sounds extreme, but it's just, it's just, it's just the reality of the situation. And this isn't going to be something that one department needs to look at. It, it, the, the, our response will cut across all departments, all levels of government. There will be uh, requirements coming down from state and federal uh, departments and levels of government for us to deal with. And, uh, it's time to, you know, get, basically get our head out of the sand and, and recognize that uh, this is going to be the biggest thing to hit us uh, as humans in probably uh, you know, 20,000 years. Uh, uh, it's not about clean energy. It's not about alternative transportation. It's not about equity. It's not about anything. It's about survival and making sure that we're throwing every resource we have at this now and, and, and every time. Uh, that, that any topic comes up that, that, we're, that we understand our responsibilities to the people. It is for the people. It is for the future. We have to do this. We have to put everything we have uh, on the front line. We are at war, and we have to take it seriously. Thank you. Gabriela Chavez-Lopez. Good afternoon. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Gabriela Chavez Lopez, and I'm the executive director of the Latina Coalition of Silicon Valley and a new District 6 resident. Um, as a strong advocate first for expanding democracy for all people, uh, I am today sharing some perspective on how ranked choice voting advances and strengthens civic participation and political parity, particularly for women and Latinas in our region. And to share my strong support for all the recommendations put forward by the uh, Charter Review Commission. Thank you for all your work. 
Um, in ranked choice elections, as stated earlier, women win. Represent Women reports that across the US, women and people of color continue to run and win in higher numbers in ranked choice elections. Also, without fear of splitting the vote or playing spoiler, multiple candidates from the same community can run for the same seat, which ultimately drives up that community's voter turnout and participation. Can candidates also benefit from the elimination of the runoff fundraising cycle, thus removing additional financial barriers for anyone running for office. The South Bay Progressive Alliance projects that implementing RCV in San Jose would increase citywide voter turnout by 79% and increase the electoral power of Latinx voters by 3.6%. After San Francisco implemented RCV, voter turnout increased by 2.7 per, uh, percent, or times, I'm sorry, 2.7 times, and in socioeconomically diverse neighborhoods, voter turnout quadrupled. Now, who wouldn't want that? All this to say that we believe that this change to our election structure would ultimately increase civic participation and remove barriers for underrepresented groups to participate more fully and deeply in our elections and campaign process throughout the city of San Jose. Thank you so much to Council Member Jimenez and Cohen for uplifting this issue. We look forward to participating actively in deeper voter engagement and education and, the ben um, and expressing our um, support for the benefits of this change. Thank you so much. Kyle Jordan. Hello, my name is Kyle Jordan and I'm a resident of District 10. I'm calling to express my support for the potential ballot measure to implement ranked choice voting in San Jose. This measure is an incredibly important path forward to allowing freer and fairer elections in the city of San Jose. As of April 2022, 55 cities, counties and states are projected to use RCV for all voters in their next election. These jurisdictions are home to approximately 10 million voters and include two states, one county, and 52 cities. Additionally, military and overseas voters can cast RCV ballots in, sorry, ballots in federal runoff elections in six states. With ranked choice voting, both candidates and voters can choose to vote their conscience instead of just strategically voting for who they think will win. There's a good case to be made that the election systems in Alaska and Maine made it easier for Senators Murkowski and Collins to show support for Judge Kentaji Brown Jackson's nomination to the Supreme Court. That's especially powerful uh, when you know that Murkowski is up for re-election this year and faces a Republican rival. It's very easy for candidates to vote their conscience rather than just stick to party lines when they're up for election in an RCV jurisdiction. The recommendation to wait and see is unnecessary. San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, San Leandro all use ranked choice voting. Why is San Jose falling behind here? Thank you. Gerardo Loera. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the City Council and Charter Commission members. My name is Gerardo Loera. I am a resident of District 5 and am the Director of Development and Communications for the Indian Health Center of Santa Clara Valley, where we serve over 22,000 patients that represent the vast diversity of our great city, including members and descendants from over 80 federally recognized American Indian tribes from throughout the United States. I appreciate the work of the Commission and ask that you adopt all Commission recommendations as submitted. In particular, I am in strong support of the inclusion of the Native Land Acknowledgement in the City's Charter and stand in direct support of the ongoing efforts of the Moet Maloney tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area to organize the ancestral descendants of their people on behalf of their future generations. Thank you. I yield my time. Monica Ariano. Monica. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Can. Okay. Hoshitpuhi, Kanakraka, Monica Villariano, Watchers Kuchu, Shmoak Maloney Tribe, San Francisco Bay Area Doc. Hello, good day. I greet you in our native Chochenyo language. I'm Monica Villariano, the Vice Chairwoman for the Moak Maloney Tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area, which includes our Thamian Ohlone speaking tribal area of San Jose. I'm asking the City Council to vote and accept the native land acknowledgement 
recommended by the city charter commission, specifically acknowledging the Moak Maloney tribe and our Thamian ancestral speaking ancestors in tribal area. The charter work extensively to be inclusive on this land acknowledgement that we support and that they you voted on unanimously. And it passed. We ask that you please accept all of their recommendations for the charter. Also, the Moak Maloney tribe agrees that there needs to be a climate change commission comprised of San Jose residents and the Moak Maloney tribe would gladly accept to have two seats on this commission. Thank you so much. Steve Chesson. Uh, thank you. I'm using a new mic. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. My name is Steve Chesson. I'm a member of the Santa Clara County Citizens Advisory Commission on Elections. We were the body that forwarded the recommendation to the Board of Supervisors that the county change its elections to ranked choice voting. The county amended its charter in 1998 to allow the Board of Supervisors to authorize changing county elections to ranked choice voting. It does not require another amendment to the county charter. That recommendation is currently under consideration by the county's Finance and Government Operations Committee. It will be back on their agenda in August, so will not go to the full board until after then, at which point the full board could decide that the county should go to ranked choice voting in 2024. I want to point out that the deadline for San Jose to put a charter amendment, for San Jose to decide whether to put a charter amendment on the November 2022 20, ballot is early August. If you wait for the county to decide to move to ranked choice voting, you will miss the window of opportunity to change San Jose's elections to ranked choice voting for the 2024 election cycle. And the earliest that you would be able to use ranked choice voting would then be 2026. I just wanted to bring that to the uh, city council's attention. Thank you very much. Jonathan Diaz. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Jonathan Diaz and I'm calling to affirm the recommendation for ranked choice voting in San Jose. I'd like to particularly note the benefit to the deepening of democracy without creating significant gaps in voters' understanding of the electoral system across demographic groups. Data consistently shows that everyone is capable of understanding rake choice voting. I hope the city council supports this commission recommendation as a standalone ballot measure to remove barriers to participation in and promote the deepening of our local democracy. Thank you. Yield my time. Carmen. Carmen. Sorry about that, couldn't unmute. Um, so I'm Carmen Brammer and I'm calling to first of all, thank the charter review team, the resident of San Jose and all the others who participate in, the, in this charter review and recommendations. I do support the charter team recommendations, especially the ranked choice voting, the Community Opportunity Purchase Act, equity and inclusion in the city programs and budgeting and elevating the board of fair campaigns and political practices in the city charter. I stand in support with all the other community speakers and I especially appreciate the comments from Bob Bromstein. Thank you. Mira. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, my name is Mira Karthik and I am a resident of District 10. Um, I'm calling to express my support for the recommendation for council members Cohen and Jimenez to put forward a ballot measure on implementing ranked choice voting in San Jose. Um, I believe that this reform will simplify our elections, increase voter turnout across all communities and improve representation at City Hall. And as a lot of people had said, um, I think that ranked choice voting is incredible because it provides benefits for both candidates and voters. Um, and specifically for in relation to voters, it eliminates like low turnout primary elections will improve voter participation, especially within racial minority groups, as was said before. And there are proven benefits for minority candidates and communities as well, because without the fear of splitting the vote or playing spoiler, multiple candidates from the same community can run for the same seat. And that's really an important feature of ranked choice voting, especially in a city as diverse as San Jose. Um, along with that, candidates also benefit from the elimination of 
of the runoff fundraising cycle and by consolidating um, two elections into one through ranked choice voting, we can have a much more meaningful and better um, process, a democratic process of voting. Um, and having that in San Jose is incredibly important to take our next step into better democracy and setting an example for other big cities around the United States. So I really do hope that you take this proposal into consideration because it means a lot to a lot of different community members around San Jose. And it definitely has the potential to create huge changes going forward for our city. Thank you. Iwad. Hi there, good afternoon council and community. My name is Hawad Haider. I'm a resident of district one and I'm calling in to express my support for the recommendation from council members Cohen and Jimenez to put forward a ballot measure on implementing ranked choice voting in San Jose. This reform will simplify our elections, increase voter turnout across all communities and improve representation at city hall. Um, I wanted to start by also echoing the comments from uh, Mr. Steve Chesson about the relationship between the city staff recommendation uh, regarding waiting for the county's input. Um, I really do think these are separate. It just makes a lot of sense what uh, Mr. Chesson has said as well, that we can make our decision here at the San Jose level. And we know that the public process is really great. It's democratic, but it takes time. So why would we put ourselves in a situation where we can't make the decision now when uh, the council is considering it, we've done the studying now, and we don't need to redo that work again in the future. I also just wanted to state that I think that the decision to put any of these recommendations, which I support all of them from the Charter Review Commission, I was tuning into a lot of the meetings, um, you know, as just a community member in D1 uh, to, to stay in touch and keeping in touch with commissioners about what they're working on as much as I can. And we can put things on the ballot uh, without necessarily saying, oh, we support this ourselves. You know, I do support RCV um, and I support the BFCCP elevation. I support the non-citizen voting. I support the land acknowledgement, all of those recommendations. Um, but I also just think that if we have these recommendations, they're already ready to go for the ballot because the Charter Review has had their own process. And unless there's any significant problems that you can find, um, then we should let the voters decide. And uh, so I appreciate all the work that's been done. Like other people have said, RCV is going in Berkeley, Oakland, SF, San Leandro, um, other places, not even just for like city elections, but other levels like um, statewide and like certain. Uh... Julie Dominguez. Julie Dominguez. Hi everyone, my name is Julie Dominguez. I'm a member of the North Maloney Tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area, also a resident of the city of San Jose. And I just want to echo the words of my Vice Chair Monica Ariano, as well as member Gloria Ariano um, and support, show support for our land acknowledgement recommendation. Um, thank you for your time. Chris Logan in person. My name is Chris Logan. I'm an organizer at Sacred Heart Community Service, where we serve tens of thousands of community members per year. Just wanted to quickly highlight the charter recommendations that our members have identified as important to them. The recommendation on boards and commissions training, stipends, and language access, as recommended unanimously, unanimously by the Charter Review Commission. Adopting equity principles. Um, this can be done through council action, but if we go that route, it could be undone or even just ignored through council action. And we think it's important that it be included in the charter. We should require an annual equity audit of departments as well as equity analysis of budgets, the annual priority setting and before major policy decisions are made by council. And we also uh, support the language um, regarding access in the charter recommendations as well. Thank you. Charlene. This is Charlene Nijma. I'm the chairwoman for the Muwekma Ohlone tribe, the San Francisco Bay Area. I strongly urge the council uh, to adopt all the recommendations that was put forth by the Charter Review Commission, specifically the native land acknowledgement. A genomic DNA study was just released by Stanford and Illinois researchers that prove a genetic link between current Muwekma members 
and to a 2000 year old uh, Ohlone uh, ancestor burial site. And I believe it's time for the cities in our Aboriginal territory to acknowledge the Moekma people and their contributions to the thousands of years of human history on these lands, including the city of San Jose. Thank you. Okay, that was our final speaker, but I would like um, to call the chair of the Charter Reef Commission, Fred Ferrer, forward. Thank you, Frederick Ferrer. The, I was had the honor of serving as chair of this commission. Um, I wanted to say uh, just a few uh, comments to close today's public hearing or the public comments piece. First of all, saying thank you to our the staff from the city who worked so tirelessly with us. Uh, our commission met for over almost a year with over 100 hours of meetings, subcommittee meetings, lots of research, as speakers have said. I wanted to thank Tony Tabor and her staff and the, um, and the city attorney's office for their, their partnership with us as a commission of uh, residents. Secondly, I wanted to say thank you to where I, my fellow commissioners, the 22 folks that you uh, nominated and put onto this commission worked hard. Um, and they spent a lot more time than I think any of us thought they would, um, but they really did take their job incredibly seriously, both doing research, um, a follow-up, meeting with the public, listening to the public. And finally, I wanna say thank you to the public. So just as today we had a number of people respond to this commission's work throughout our process, we spent hours and hours listening to the public and really trying to figure out ways to not only engage the public, and our community, but also then to be responsive to them in the recommendations. I think that the memo that you sent us originally that I was um, chaired, uh, that was written and penned by Vice Mayor Jones and Council Member Jimenez really asked us to look at these issues of governance, which I think we did at the very beginning and really had answers to those very specific questions you asked. But your last part of your memo where you asked for increased availability from the community around equity, accountability, and transparency at City Hall, is where we spent the majority of our year. And I think it's an important aspect of the work of the Charter Commission that we really were focusing in on trying to hear from the community what were the issues of equity, accountability, and transparency at City Hall. And I um, have great respect for the city's uh, staff's response to us today. Um, and I do feel like two things. One, I think a lot of these questions should go to the voters to make let them have the decision. That was certainly clearly what we heard from the public throughout our year. And secondly, I think that the spirit of the recommendations really are, how do we increase the issues of equity within our community? Um, I think that the great debate that we can start on all these issues is one that I'd love the city to have, because I think in the end, equity will be the thing that is the victor. Uh, again, thank you for the, the time and the effort and the energies you're spending today um, and the actions you take forward on our, all our recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Fred, and uh, thank you to all the members of the Charter Review Commission and all, also for all the public speakers who came out and offered their opinion on all the different recommendations. Uh, before I go to my council colleagues, uh, Lee, I just have a, just a process question. So let's, let's take um, like one particular recommendation, like ranked choice voting. Can you walk me through step by step what happens if we vote to move that forward now and then walk me step by step in terms of we uh, vote to have it uh, go next in the distinction between the two. Sure. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, so with the example of ranked choice voting, um, if you were to put that into the now category as a council, it would give us direction, um, all three appointees, actually the city manager, city attorney, and city clerk to work on a 75 word ballot statement and all of the work that goes behind a ballot measure. And our goal would uh, to bring that forward to the council for approval and placement on the ballot um, by the last meeting in June. Um, as one of the speakers noted, the deadline uh, to place something on the ballot is early August. So our goal would be to get that in front of you um, by the end of June. Separately, other items I would say in the, the now category and, and ranked choice voting is probably its own thing. There are several recommendations here um, that were to move forward under the now category that could be placed together in a single measure. Um, I don't believe ranked choice voting is one of those. 
um, but several measures could be combined into one measure that would accomplish several of those. And we would do the same work. We would be working with the attorney's office and clerk to put that 75 words and, and all of the uh, various legal documents together to bring forward by the end of June. And, and Lee, what happens about the next for a second part of the question? Correct. I, I was just pausing to, to get my <laughs> breath. Sorry. Um, for the next category, um, so those would be items that you may want to consider for um, uh, charter changes in November 2024, 2026, or um, as we've articulated in our staff memorandum, could be accomplished um, through ordinance or council policy. And so if the council places something in the next category, we would be analyzing it, but bringing forward those select things that you place in that now bucket to the May 16th priority setting as part of the budget study session roadmap exercise so that those can be then prioritized against all of the other work that has already been directed to the administration. So just so I understand, you said the now bucket, did you, did you mean the, anything in the next bucket? Would yeah, so to... I'm saying it now is for, you know, the roadmap exercise that will be taking place on May 16th is, is for post June 30th, it's for next fiscal year. So the, the roadmap is intended to focus us for, for next year. Anything that you decide to place on the ballot now in that category wouldn't go into that roadmap process because it's it's not, um, the, the timing doesn't line up. So the council directs um, you know staff to prepare things for the ballot measure. This team, is, as well as Mark Vanny in the audience, will, will have to work those issues through um, between now and June, um, if that is feasible. And what I'm saying is, uh, as another example, if you place something in the next category, it would go through additional workload analysis, prioritization by the mayor and council. Okay, that, that was the clarification there. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, thank, thank you, Lee. So I'm gonna go to um, my first council colleague, uh, Council Member Cohen. Uh, thank you. I, I wanna start by thanking the members of the Charter Commission, Chair Ferrer and everybody else who was on that commission for uh, the incredible work the detailed work, the, all the research and uh, thoughtfulness that went into it. It's a long overdue process. Obviously the committee, the city, city hasn't had such a thorough review in a long time. And I think it's a very um, valid thing to have, make sure that we do regularly um, to have people look it over and, and um, be very thoughtful about it. Um, and I, you know, I don't, as I think you pointed out, uh, Chair, uh, the, um, I don't know that anybody expected this much work when you started, but I think it was important that you did all that work because now we know that what comes, what came out was, was really thoughtful and well-reasoned. Um, whether we agree with all of them or not, I think that it's clear that there, was definite, there were definite reasons behind every recommendation. So I wanna thank you for that. Um, I have a couple of questions before I kind of move on to the memo that Council Member Jimenez and I wrote. Um, first one, what is, remind me again, what is the cost to the city to put something on the ballot for each measure? Uh, the first measure, it's about $600,000. I can I can pull it up and give you the exact numbers in. Just give me a minute. Okay. That, that, I mean, I don't need the exact number. Ballpark is good. So about $600,000 per measure. And so I, I think one of the things that I was thinking through as we looked at this was, you know, for the first, and they a little less, I guess, for other measures, right? If you do well, more than once. Uh, if it's a standalone, if there's no mayoral election, it's like a million and a half. Well, right. So if you have a, another citywide item, it's about 600000 and then each other one's just a little bit less than that, but yeah. Half a million to 600,000, yeah. okay. Yeah, so, so it's, it, I think it's important to be thoughtful about priorities and timing because we don't necessarily wanna, first of all, we don't wanna overload the voters with too much at one time because I think that it's complicated enough to understand one charter amendment versus three versus seven. <laughs> um, and then obviously trying to make sure we're not spending a lot of city money all at the same time as well, I think is important. So. Um, the idea of consolidation, I think, is is important one. Um, you mentioned the idea of rolling things together into one, and I, you know, I, you can see in the memo that we wrote that we suggested that. <laughs> what are your thoughts about items six through ten? They're mo they mostly deal they deal with the land acknowledgement, equity, um, gender neutral language in the charter. Things that I think many of us can agree with, but from my opinion, it would be great to be able to accomplish through a single measure since they kind of relate to one another. Do you, are there any thoughts yet about what could be consolidated or not? 
Yeah, I'm going to ask the city attorney to jump in. Um, but we have in the past, um, I think it was in 2008 or 2018, Nora, we, we had a, a charter modernization thing on uh, measure on that did a few different things. So I think six through um, 10 probably could be combined into a modernization or update into one single measure. Um, yes, we think that that can probably uh, occur under that rubric. Okay, thank you. All right, so just now to get a little bit into specifics of our memo and, and make a motion. Um, so, so I, and I also want to appreciate uh, Lee and your office for the uh, for the process that you put in place for the voting. I, I think I think doing that might have might have helped us, but I think actually having a, a starting point for discussion is a, is more helpful. Um, being able to specifically talk about recommendations and without um, sort of an arbitrary vote at the beginning. So I'm going to move a memo, and and that motion will include su supplanting that prioritization voting process um, as part of it. Um, the motion number item number one uh, places um, ranked choice voting on the ballot for this November. Uh, we believe that it's um, something that should align us with the other big cities in our area. Um, in addition to the save the money cost savings for the city, which I think which is significant, I, it's about three million dollars to hold a primary election. Without holding the primary election, we save the city three million dollars every two years. Um, it also aligns with our council's objective of aligns with the objective of maximizing voter participation. We have a ballot measure this year to move the mayoral election for that purpose. Um, having all of the voter, all the candidates appear on the ballot in the general election when voter turnout is highest provides the most input uh, that the voters can give um, as to who their preferences are. So um, that's, that's at least my feeling for why we're including that. Um, second one, moving forward with ballot measure to elevate the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practice to the city charter. That one, because of the question of timing, when we want to put how many ballot measures on the ballot, we left it kind of open-ended as far as whether it's a now or next because of having too many things on the ballot at one time. Um, consolidating charter revisions six through 10 into one ballot measure is recommendation number three with the caveat in their language that says any charter revision adopted by the council, which means the council would have to have a little bit of conversation, whether it's here or in the future about all the specifics in there, because there may be some specifics that are that are we can leave out that we just not all of us agree with or that are um, things that can be done through ordinance and other action and don't necessarily need to go on the ballot. And we want to maximize the chance of getting the most important things passed without muddying the ballot measure. And number four, um, I think it's important for us to have a conversation about what the appropriate size of the council is as the city grows. It's not obvious to me what the right number is. Um, and I've been thinking about things like scaling the automatically scaling in the charter, the number of seats based on population as the city grows, it would trigger automatic changes every census. So you don't have to do this regularly every uh, so often when you decide the council's too small. Um, but given that the, we just did the redistricting process and the next one won't happen until 2030, there's no hurry. So I recommend bringing this back in 2025 so we can decide whether 2026 or 2028 would be the right time to go to the ballot to make that change. Um, number, I'm gonna skip number five for a second, number six. Um, the components that do not require ballot measure um, would be included in number six. We would bring those to the roadmap discussion and decide which ones are important to us and um, have that discussion there. Number five, um, declining numbers two and 11 from the charter review uh, and not moving those forward. I'm adding to that. I didn't put it in the memo. We didn't put it in the memo, but I want to add to the motion declining number one. Number one isn't really a most of it isn't a recommendation. Most of it is to leave the process, the system the way it is. Um, and then uh, my feeling is that the process for hiring the city manager is something that can be handled through board through council policy um, and doesn't necessarily warrant going to the ballot. So I will move my mem move our memo um, and add declining number one in to to it as well to item number five. Second. Thank you, uh, Council Member Cohen. Uh, just a quick clarification. If I was trying to categorize each one of your items, um, so I have your item number one as a now, item number two as a, as a next, 
Item number three is the next. Item four is later. Item five is Klein. And item six is later. Is that correct? Well, it, yeah, kind of. I mean, number I think number three is a now too, but I did actually forget to ask this one question of staff, which is it's complicated to take that, put it all into one ballot measure, consolidate everything, write the language and get it back to us by June. And so I did want to ask about the amount of time it would take and whether we could have a ballot measure ready by June on that item. For, for which item? For number work? three, which is the consolidated six through 10. Yeah. So I would say that depends on the, the council conversation. Um, there's an awful lot of specificity um, in some of the recommendations from the Charter Commission that I think we would need to work through. Um, you know, just as an example, and because so many speakers spoke about it, um, you know, as an example, recommendations nine and um, I believe it's nine and 10 that deal with equity. Um, there's a certain level of specificity and detail in the commission's report, which is great. Um, and, you know, in our analysis, the commission says, you know, this doesn't all actually need to happen in the charter. It can happen elsewhere. Um, and so, you know, it references the code of ethics in the charter, section 607. And um, the charter um, section uh, 607 around code of ethics, it has these high level goals and then attaches to a city ordinance that you guys over time can go ahead and modify um, versus the recommendations around some of the objectives and measurements around equity are very specific. So, you know, through the conversation here, one alternative would be to include those higher level goals and then allow us to work it out through ordinance or policy and bring it back to you. And so things like that, where it's a, a high level goal, um, you know, it's probably easier for us to combine um, through a single measure and bring it back in June versus if there's a lot of specificity and additional policy review to work out between now and say, you know, the end of June, um, that is a tough exercise for staff, especially around uh, the legal work and the 75 word testing that we would want to do. Right. So that was my concern. But if I were to have my preference to answer your question directly, I would put number one and three as a now, but I also, I think may, we made some comments in the, in the body to say that's part of the conversation. I don't think that we as authors of the memo were totally wedded to any dates for any of them, except to say that we think these are our priorities and depending on when they can be done and what the council thinks is the right approach to spacing them out, I think we'd be amenable to that conversation. Thank you. Um, council member Esparza. Thank you. Um, I, I also would like to thank the commission um, and uh, shout out to uh, Chair Fred Ferrer. I think it's, um, it, it was a lot of work, a lot of time, um, and I think it has raised some really core issues in the city um, around equity. Um, in 2019, five of us brought up equity to the council. Um, and while some of that work in 2020, the council unanimously voted to create the Office of Racial Equity, and there is some work ongoing. Um, frankly, I think equity is, and, and really embedding this in the city's processes is, uh, it's some of the most important that we can do. Um, because that will live beyond us. Um, and that's really what we fought for. We didn't fight for an after school program. We didn't fight for a specific project. Um, we fought for uh, the entire budget um, and the choices that the city makes on what moves forward, what doesn't, um, how we decide to fund certain things. And in fact, recently I brought up um, earmarks, the fact that we hadn't initially gone through an equity process on the earmarks for millions of dollars um, that we advocated uh, for successfully for the city. Um, and so that is my preference being uh, one of the council districts that um, that has a lot of inequity. I, I'm, I, I District 5 and District 7 were the most imbalanced council districts in the city um, in a lot of ways. Um, I, um, I did want to ask a question um, 
I'll move forward. Actually, I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, I, um, I do think uh, I support the idea of meeting and reviewing around the census process um, and how that works out, whether that's 2025 or 2028, as we get closer to census so that we, um, we look at some of these changes that we might need to make around that, I think is important to do. I agree with elevating the fair campaign for political practices. Um, I do uh, support reforming boards and commissions, but I had a question. Um, so when we, uh, when I look at the recommendation and then when I look at the budget, um, there's a dollar amount to that. And, and you know, it's what, 1.6 million, is that correct? For the total cost of, it, of moving this forward? Okay, so a standalone um, ballot measure without another citywide measure is about 1.6 million. Um, a ballot measure where there's already another citywide measure or item like the mayoral election is 644,000. And that's per measure, so each measure. Okay. But does that include this cost of stipends? That that had been raised for um, the, okay. No, it, council member Esparza, the, the cost for the stipend specifically, that would be an ongoing cost that would need to be absorbed into the city budget. Okay, I, um, I, I wanted to give my thoughts on this, which, you know, when we initially proposed the memo, um, equity, uh, there was a graphic attached to that that I know a lot of folks um, are familiar with, uh, but it's because whenever we talk about equity, we invariably go, uh, uh, conversation invariably goes to equality um, versus equity. And um, I, I have appointed commissioners that have uh, come to me and, um, and have said, yeah, I, I don't make a lot of money and, and I'm spending a lot of hours and hours of time and, um, and it's a concern for them. And, and I also believe one of my other commissioners is um, one of the low income commissioners, right, where they have to check a box. Um, I, I, I think there's a lot of wiggle room here in terms of uh, does every commissioner need a, need or want a stipend? How about we make that money available for folks, um, you know, that that need it, that want it? Um, and so I, uh, so that that was a question that I had. Do we have to? Does this city require us to do that on an equal basis to all commissioners, or could they um, request it? It's a member of Sparza. It's my understanding that you have flexibility and we have flexibility on how we would implement that. Um, as an example, you'll be taking action, I believe tomorrow uh, for HDDC, uh, will you be providing a stipend to the individual that's added um, um, that is unhoused uh, with lived experience so that you can be specific around some things that we probably need to work on with the attorney's office around income level or need um, if this were to progress. Okay, I think it's an important issue. Um, we do have working families that sacrifice a shift um, uh, uh, for some of the commissions um, and, and others are able to do it and that's a blessing. It, it really is a blessing. I know a million years ago when I served as a commissioner, I was very earnest and super excited about spending two evenings a week and all day Saturdays on a commission. <laughs> and. Um, uh, I know there are other folks that uh, may may not be able to get that much time because of childcare or uh, the need to cover some shifts. And so I think that's, we have some little room there on the cost. Um, I, uh, I wanted to give some feedback on the acknowledging the native land and the charter. I, I hear that that is gonna take a little bit more work to make sure that we are doing that with other tribes that have reached out and said, hey, we weren't included in that process and um, that we need to include them. And, and I think it's still the right thing to do um, and that we can figure out a way to do that. Um, same on the gender inclusive language. I did have a question on um, the expansion um, of city uh, and, and the timing of this. And if Fred is, is still there, I'd like to hear uh, from the commission. 
Um, one of the things that I really jumped out to me was representing a high need um, district uh, that when, when we studied this at the, at the council, we learned that the uh, commissions with the high, or I'm sorry, the districts with the uh, most diverse and low income populations were uh, specifically put on off year cycles to um, diminish voter participation. Um, and so I, I was surprised not to hear a recommendation from the charter to flip uh, the odd number districts, particularly looking at D3, D5, and D7 have some of the highest need communities in the city. Um, why, why wasn't, what was the thinking on that? Uh, thank you, Council Member uh, Esparza, for your question. I think if you go to the report and you look at uh, Professor um, uh, that um, from San Jose State, there was a number of studies that were looked at in terms of voter participation. And what they showed was that there wasn't a decrease in participation in those out years as much as there was an increase when you added it to the other place. So um, that was one of the questions that came up in public as well as from the commissioners. And I think if you go to the report and look at uh, per, uh, Professor Percival's study and the, the amendment that was put in there, you'll see um, the analysis that was done in terms of voter participation in presidential years and then in the out years. Because that was the challenge was if you go, to, if you move everything in the presidential year, you move the mayor's election, what happens to those out districts? Um, and they didn't show a, a negative impact on that as much as the greater impact on the mayor election. Thank you. Um, and I know that that was included in the um, last study session that we had, uh, or was it study session or council item where we discussed the turnout um, and that was tied to the mayoral race. Um, but I, I, I have um, seen um, with the past elections, particularly young voters getting more engaged, um, which is super important. Um, and would like to continue that trend. Um, just a couple of comments on the expansion. Um, I think that any expansions of the council districts should be done with redistricting um, because this it was a painful process for us uh, under re redistricting and uh, I if we're gonna do that, they should be done together. I can only imagine what it would be like for us, for example, right now to expand and to make some of those hard decisions um, that would be required. Um, so uh, I, did, I wanted to get to my comments on ranked choice voting. Um, I have a lot of concerns about it. And in fact, the Latino community has had a lot of concerns about this in recent years. Um, I don't know if my colleagues have remembered, particularly those active in the Democratic Party, but a lot of the Latino organizations had participated in previous discussions, a lot of discussions and meetings on this in years past um, due to those concerns. Um, and, and those are my concerns. I represent some of those high needs communities. I, I talk to my voters a lot um, and I do think, uh, and have done a little bit of research on other cities. Generally, the academic research produces mixed or inconclusive results concerning communities of color. Um, and in one, uh, in a study with the 2016 study by researchers at the University of Missouri, um, now, similar levels of socioeconomic and racial disparities in voter participation in plurality and ranked choice voting elections. Um, another study pointed out a large amount of ballot exhaustion in California elections using ranked choice voting and age and education rela related turnout disparities are more pronounced in San Francisco after the adoption of ranked choice voting. Um, I also wanted to add that um, in New York, um, many members of the city council's Black, Latino, and Asian caucus opposed ranked choice voting and in fact sued to delay its rollout. So did 
the NAACP. They argued it burdened communities already struggling due to the pandemic and had concerns that voter education didn't reach seniors, non-English speakers, people without internet access. Um, and Council Member Miller, co-chair of the caucus stated, it is sophisticated voter suppression, but it is voter suppression. Mayor Eric Adams noted in reference to ranked choice voting, that's not the reality when English is a second language. That's not the reality for 85, 90 year old voters who are trying to navigate the process. Every new barrier in place, you're going to lose voters in the process. I knew that was going to be a problem and it turned out to be a problem. New York State NAACP President Hazel Dukes also called ranked choice voting voter suppression. In California, we saw um, the number one voter uh, concerns around a lack of a democratic process because number one voter, um, folks that got the number one vote, uh, uh, in fact, did not win. And in fact, in some of those elections, uh, there were campaigns to try and get the number two and ineffectively uh, kind of game the system so that the number one voter, vote getter did not win. I'll tell you one of my concerns after reading the memo, um, representing District 7, having some of the city's most low income communities, is I've spent a lot of time, a lot of time going door to door um, in my district to help folks. I have gone door to door in the businesses. I've gone door to door in neighborhoods in the census where districts five and seven uh, had the least um, turnout. It, 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 was, it was us, it was city workers, part-time PRNS workers, council member Carrasco's office staff and my office staff who went out door to door <laughs> to talk to folks to get them to fill it out. During the pandemic, we've had to go door to door and actually open up uh, a rental assistance center in District 7 to make it easier for the East Side folks to come and get help in their language and sit down with someone to go through and to ask their questions, to get some help filling things out because during a pandemic, especially, it's been really hard. And so having, we're switching, we're proposing switching a system about representation in months, and we're doing it in what this council has already determined has less of a voter turnout of people of color. And we're so concerned about that as a council we're moving mayoral elections to presidential elections to get more voter turnout. But we're, we're, there's a proposal to put that in November this year, while communities like mine are still struggling tremendously with the pandemic. In fact, there was a news article today about the increase in folks needing food at one of the food distribution sites in my district, of which I still have many. So switching the system while we're still struggling to get out of this pandemic, talk to the very voters who are impacted the most is a concern. It is not a now for me. The people in my districts are struggling to survive. They're struggling to still stay alive. And so um, I'd like to ask for an amendment, um, if I may. On number one, to bring this back to council to discuss placing the ballot on the mayoral election, November 2024 ballot, the very election that this council has voted to, that is acknowledged will have a much higher voter turnout of, by minorities, women, and young people. And that's that's the amendment. I'm, I'm willing to consider, but I just want to also just answer some of the questions that were asked in your comments, council member, first ask before I do that. Yeah, well, I didn't ask questions. I know, but I mean, some, of the, some of the study information, I have some, some other studies I wanted to bring talk about well, first, but I'm willing to- And I, I acknowledge yeah. that they're mixed. Yeah. 
No, I understand. I'm, so I, I mean, I'm not saying no, but I'm not saying yes yet. <laughs> I just wanted to be able well, to. Well, I, I wouldn't <laughs> be able to vote for it. I would have okay. to vote against your, um, I would have to vote against uh, against it if if that could not be accommodated. Council Member Esparza, I was actually going to ask Council Member Cohen to bifurcate item number one anyway. So I think that would address okay. your concerns. So Council Member Cohen, I'll go ahead and, and ask, make that request right now. Yeah, um, yeah, I assume that that would be a, a reasonable thing to do in this list, that this one would require more discussion than some of the others. So I'm willing to do that. And is that all right with yes. the seconder? All right. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Esparza, did you have anything else? Um, so we're bifurcating the measure at uh, number one, and are we changing the date from number one to November 2024 to bring it back to council for discussion for the November 2024 ballot? So right now it's just to bifurcate it, but we can have we'll be able to have that discussion in terms of okay. I'll take the total, dates. and then I'll I'll take the total, and then come back to number one. Thank you. Great, thanks, uh, Councilmember Foley. Thank you. First, uh, I want to thank the Charter Commission for the many, many hours of time and dedication you gave to all of these thoughtful issues. I truly appreciate that and appreciate your thoughtfulness. And I've had conversations with some of the commissioners, at least my two commissioners, and appreciate their dedication to the process as well. Um, I really uh, I came in with mixed feelings about the ranked choice voting. And then after council member Esparza articulated so well what I didn't have the, um, the language to articulate, the effect on seniors, the effect on other populations who may have difficulty in understanding the ballot, uh, makes me very concerned about the ranked choice voting and, and moving it to uh, 2022, but since we're, we're bifurcating, I'll, I'll talk about the, the rest of them. And I, I, and actually I would support moving it to 2024 if that came forward, 2024 to be placed on the ballot, let's put it that way. Um, I do have some questions. Uh, I, and I appreciate council member Cohen and Jimenez, your, your memo, because it kind of, uh, focused our conversation a little bit. Um, and, and I appreciate that direction. I have a question about the uh, item number six, which is a reform, well, not on your memo, it's from your memo, it's item number two, consolidate any charter commissions and six through 10. I'm fine with that, except I'm concerned about item number six, because I feel there's three points there which staff articulated. The first one requires a charter amendment. The other two do, do not and perhaps should be separated and investigated immediately to see if we can implement them. Uh, the stipend and then the training. I see no reason why sh we should delay on the training and no reason to delay on the Stipend, the stipend requires, uh, in my mind, investigation at the budgetary level to see, we know it's an implication of around 600,000, but it, is that all commissions, all charter, or just the charter commission, the, those commissions that are under the charter who would benefit from the stipend, or would it be all of, all of our commissioners? And I'm not opposed to one or the other, but I do think we need to investigate that, let that further. And so I consider it more of a later than a, a, or a next, rather than a now, because I'm afraid if we put it on the ballot, we're putting six items or several items on the ballot with a 75, in, can, can, combined together with 75 words, and it's going to be very confusing to our voting population. I do like uh, and support the idea of if we put ranked choice voting on the ballot, that be a separate item. I think that's really critical and that the other items can be combined. I don't have a concern about combining them, except that the language becomes confusing over each of the items. And I think they are all important, uh, particularly 
the native land acknowledgement, the gender inclusive language is really, really critical. And I, while I hear the concerns from staff, we can't wait on, on those amendments and, or those changes, neither can we wait on establishing equity values, et cetera, addressing equity inclusion in programming and budgeting. I, we've, we've already stated that those are important and by putting them on the charter on the ballot to be voted on in November shows that they truly are a priority to us and just uh, emphasizes how important inclusivity is to us. So I, I, I support much of the memo. I'm not sure about the ranked choice voting yet uh, and would like to see it come back in 2024, really based on all of the really um, insightful arguments made by council member Esparza. I had a couple of questions. I think actually most of my questions were answered as we were going along. Um, in fact, I think, oh, Oh, the one question I had was was regarding around the the native land acknowledgement. Um, the the comment was made that we should delay and investigate further because of concerns or involvement with other tribal groups. But could we not put it on the ballot and engage other tribal groups in their discussions as well? Is there a reason? I don't see this to be a, an either or, I see this an and. Uh, so how can we put it forward and continue to have discussions with the other tribal groups? And can you share with us what the concerns of the other tribal groups that have come up are? Um, Council Member Foley, Michelle McGurk. Um, Thanks, from Michelle. The city manager's office. We, um, we can engage between now and um, and June 30th when we would bring back the ballot measure. So that that's something that staff would need to um, be assigned to do and and could could add that uh, very quickly to our work plans. Um, the concerns came at one of the final meetings, if I recall, uh, and the city clerk and city, uh, city attorney's office could share as well. And it was just some testimony from groups who had not been part of the process. Um, so we don't know the full extent um, of additional engagement that might be required. Um, and so uh, staff really just wanted to ensure that whatever process in developing, because the charter is something that can only be changed by the voters, we wanted to ensure that the process would be inclusive and, um, and in depth, um, not to diminish the work that the Charter Review Commission did. They did a phenomenal job of outreach. Um, however, this was one of you know, the 15 recommendations we're discussing today. And there are, you know, as, as we've talked about, many, many recommendations in addition to the ones we're talking about today. So, um, because these concerns came quite late in the process, we staff was um, erring on the side of caution. Um, and that's because the charter is a much more permanent document. We could um, do something through ordinance more quickly um, and, and bring that forward or, um, which is what other cities have done. Um, and then bring the charter forward later. Um, that's one possibility. Or we could, um, you know, so we presented what we found from our research of the 10 largest cities in California in the staff report. Um, the charter is a very valuable place to do this. And so we just want to get it right. So I hope, I hope that's helpful, Council Member. It does, and, and thank you. And I agree that we want to get it right. So between now and the time we have to vote to put it on the ballot, uh, uh, can we have those conversations with the other tribal groups? Yes, we most certainly can uh, make that uh, part of our work. Okay, thank you. Uh, then I have a question for uh, Council Member Cohen regarding item number four of your memo, memo on return to council in 2025 for the 
appropriate discussion about the appropriate size of council. That actually seems premature to me. I, I, I would be happy to support that if it said 2030 or connected to the next census process, because it, it seems to me to have this conversation in 2025 really doesn't make sense. We don't have the data that we need. We, we don't, as far as the census is concerned, and we're going to have a discussion over the census and redistricting in 2030, or not we, but some, some people may in this group uh, be on this, on this dais, I'm not sure, in 2030 about redistricting. And that's the time to have the discussion also about redistricting and increasing the number of uh, council members. So 2025 just seems early. And the, the, the item is to bring it back to council. So I'm not sure what kind of a discussion we will have at council in, in 2025. Can you articulate why 2025 and why it should come back to council before it, instead of going someplace else first, before it comes back to us, such as redistricting? So yeah, we talked to, I'm oh, sorry. Um, actually, staff can respond to Okay, that. go ahead. Okay. Don't mind, council member. Um, sure. Uh, so council member Foley, when we looked at the process, there is a very um, specific timing that um, the other cities that are expanding their councils go through. And so we get the, we get data from population data from the census and other sources, the California Department of Finance, on a regular basis. Um, the final numbers come in, you know, the census takes place in, on the decade, and then we get the data and, and launch redistricting. Um, there's some timing around decision making to um, redistrict for the particular size. So when we look at what Fort Worth and Columbus did, they decided in advance that if their population grew, to a certain amount, then they would expand the council in the redistricting process. But you need they you need to go to the voters to get that authority first. And so I don't know if 2025 is the magic year, but we would need to develop a work plan to say like this is the point at which you would you would do it in advance so that when you start redistricting, you're redistricting for a council of 12, 14, et cetera. Um, and then that takes time. Of course, it's much more complicated to do redistricting uh, when you're doing whole new council districts versus if you're just changing the borders of 10 existing council uh, seats. I, I didn't, you know, when I, we did the research and looked at Columbus and Fort Worth, they are actually, um, getting got perilously close to the final deadline for their elections, which are in 2023, um, to adopt the final maps with their new council districts. It's, it's hugely complicated because of how it impacts the seats on the council um, that are already in process. So as we said in our memo, um, the earliest that we could implement anything is 2026 if we were to start redistricting today for 14 seats because everybody who's running right now um, in 2022 will be in office until 2026. Um, so that's, they have a four year seat that they are running for in November. Um, so we would have to go to the voters and have those seats. And, the attorney's office could probably explain the legalities of that a little bit more than I just did, but you know it's similar to why you put the mayoral, uh, the change of the mayoral election timing, on the ballot in June, so everyone running for um, election in November will know whether they are being seated for a two-year term or a four-year term. So I hope that's helpful. Very, very helpful. Thank you. So we, we really need to have the discussion before we put the item on the ballot to determine whether the voters want to expand the number of council members from 10 to whatever the appropriate size is. Um, so then I guess my, my question, I, and I appreciate all of that, Michelle, that was very helpful. 
is to council member Cullen, the, your memo asks for this to come to council to have this discussion. Should it come go to a committee first and then to council? And uh, because it, it, it seems, I, I guess it's a council discussion, absolutely, but, and staff has to prepare the recommendation. So maybe just directly straight to the council is a good idea, unless there's a committee that should vet it before it comes to us. And I'm not sure there is. So um, it, it, do you have any thoughts about, about that, about it coming directly to council before it goes through committee? I'm open to that. I mean, I don't think I was be, we were being uh, prescriptive on what that process is. It was more about the timing. And I think there's a lot of other elements of the timing that Michelle didn't mention. If you were to expand, there would be some runway needed in order to build this build out space and offices and in order to figure out how we're going to budget for more offices. So I believe that a 2026 ballot measure to say that after 2030, there'll be a bigger council makes sense because it gives the city time to prepare for the impacts, which are significant. Um, and therefore, that's why I recommended 2025 as a, as a time to have that discussion. But I also I think in our in our. Um, discussion, we said that at that time, we would decide whether 2026 or 2028 is the appropriate time to go to the voters, but it just gives the council time to, to figure that out. Having said that, if there's a committee that you recommend to go to first, I mean, I, that that part is reasonable if there's a, an appropriate place. I'm not sure what that place is, though. Yeah, thank you. I'm not either. I was, I'm <laughs> sitting here thinking, well, which committee would it go to? I don't, I don't really know. It's not, I, I don't know. So council, ultimately, we have the ulti we have the say, right? So coming to us makes perfect sense. And it is um, a huge decision to make both from a representation standpoint, but also from a monetary standpoint and logistically how you would handle whatever that right size of city council members is. So uh, I guess I'm fine with it as it is. Moving back to item six. Um, item, not, not item six of your memo, item three, and uh, including six through 10, what are your thoughts about um, excluding or including a friendly amendment, amendment that allows uh, immediate implementation or uh, of I, the, sec, the two parts of the the training and the uh, investigation into the stipend away from a budget uh, uh, ballot measure. Thinking that those two items really don't need to be in the ballot measure. Oh, well, I guess I'll, my, my answer would be um, yes, I think that's fair. And uh, I'll ask staff, can we have an MBA as part of this year's budget process to do those things? And then I would amend the motion to include those as that, that is the action to get an MBA so we can move forward with those items. Yeah, uh, Council Member Cohen, I, I think a manager's budget addendum is the most appropriate um, forum. They're both resource questions for you guys to make. Right. Um, so they don't need to be added to the ballot. So, um, you know, I, I think what we would do is prepare a manager's budget addendum that shows the cost, but we could also certainly include um, criteria and and more formalized costs around if it went to everyone versus if we went to a distribution method based off of income level or something else to address council member as far as this concern as well. Great. Would you accept that as a friendly friendly amendment then, council member Cohen? Yes. Okay. Thank you. With that, uh, my comments are concluded. Thank you. Thank you. Is that all right with the seconder? Yes. All right, council member Davis. Thank you. And I want to thank council member Esparza for her comments on uh, about rank choice voting. Um, it's very helpful. I, I also have concerns about rank choice voting. One of the things I didn't didn't hear mentioned was the mail ballots and how how that may impact. Um, I have heard that studies have shown that that mail ballots for rank choice voting have a much higher rate of errors because there aren't election helpers or uh, scanners that can help explain it and no replacement ballot possible. And I know that in Santa Fe, when they changed to ranked choice voting, they spent uh, $350,000 on education in two languages. That election had only 20,000 voters and they had a 
increase in spoiled ballots. So that's a concern since everybody gets a mail-in ballot and I think most people um, fill out their ballot and drop it off as opposed to going to a voting center. So that's a, an additional concern I have for, for ranked choice voting. And I would, um, I'm just not ready to, su to support going to the ballot with that yet. I have some other questions and concerns about the, um, the items six through 10. I think it, it looked like there are some alternatives to a few of them and just piggybacking on council member Foley's concern about having, it's five, right? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, five um, items and 75 words only um, per ballot statement, getting all of those in when we could do, and there is work already underway for some of these for, um, for documents going forward and for council policies or resolutions. So I, I noticed in particular um, for recommendation nine and 10, work is already in progress for these or in process. And I'm wondering if we could rather direct staff to accelerate that work instead of putting it into a ballot measure, because I do have a concern that this is a lot of, a lot of issues to, to put into one. So I appreciate that items B and C for the, for item six uh, are not included in there, but we still have part of item six. We have then, so that's the, about the charter commissions. And the native land acknowledgement, gender inclusive language, which I'm not sure exactly, where was that one? It says it's in process for city documents going forward, but it does require a charter amendment. Can you explain that a little bit more? Does that make it retroactive? Is that what that would mean? No, the charter amendment for gender neutral language would just be simply editing the charter to where there's a reference to he, she, any kind of language. I think there would um, it would require the city attorney's office and the city manager's office, the clerk's office, to go through and just change those to gender neutral terminology. Okay, so it's just to change. So the charter, the the measure that would be placed on the ballot would just be to change the charter language itself so, to be gender neutral. Is that so correct? What we could do and what we're proposing to do is if council wishes to update the charter to have gender, excuse me, gender neutral language, um, when with whatever other measure we would, because you have, um, your updates to the charter, we would just go through and update the language at that time. And so it wouldn't, it's not, it's not quite the same as something that has a really comp complicated policy decision for the voters. Okay. It's more an editorial action to update the charter language. Okay. Um, and it's a one-time cost for staff time. Yeah, to, to do. A, it would it would be and, and it's not terribly ex extensive. I think we, it just is that it is some pretty heavy duty proofreading because staff can, you know, wants to make sure we we would get it all right. But yeah, but we've talked about that with the attorney's office and and it would it would be do, quite doable. It would be something different if you wanted us to say. Go back and change historic, you know, council memos written from 1975 or something like that. Oh, I don't think anybody wants, that. <laughs> you know, but if you, if that's sentencing to someone to a dungeon of microfiche, I think yeah. that is unnecessary. But, but our practice is we are trying to go forward and train staff to use gender neutral language in staff reports and, and city documents going forward. 
And so the charter is one of those documents we could edit, um, but it does require voter approval. So we've done things like that in the past where we've updated archaic language and the council, that's just been part of the overall change. Okay, and then for, for recommendation six, just to clarify, the, the charter amendment would be to allow non-citizens to be on the three charter commissions, right? Yes, the charter, um, the remaining, out of the remaining commissions, 18 out of the remaining 19 commissions do not include a requirement to be a registered voter or a citizen. They might just require San Jose residency. Okay. And I'm sorry, I don't have it at my fingertips. Which of the commissions do require, and do they require citizenship or do they require being a registered voter or both? They require being a registered voter. I believe the planning commission specifically refers to citizenship um, and um, civil service commission and salary setting commission both refer to uh, being a registered elector of the city of San Jose or a registered voter. Okay, and the non-charter commission? Uh, the only one that requires it is the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices, which is pertaining to elections, mm -hmm. and it requires the members to be registered voters. Okay. So I'm a little bit um, torn about whether that should go along with the issue that we're discussing on the 29th about non-citizens being able to vote in local elections. They seem to kind of go hand in hand to me. Um, and then in terms of the, I think I understand the, the native land acknowledgement would be added to the charter, obviously. The gender inclusive language sounds relatively easy. I think, honestly, the recommendation nine and 10 about uh, equity and inclusion, I think are going to be tough to put into, would be tough to put into a 75 word ballot statement just by itself. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not in favor of having these all together. It's just very concerning to me that we won't be able to have a discussion about the individual merits of these um, pretty weighty issues because it's, it's a big change. Um, to, to talk about equity versus equality in, in our city. And that's not a fulsome discussion that we've, we've had. We've started to have it. We've had a couple of discussions and putting it to the ballot already um, without knowing what that means and how it will impact our budget. I, I just, um, it seems premature to me. So I'm concerned about that as well. Um, I look forward to hearing more from my colleagues. Thank you, Councilmember Carrasco. Hi there. Thank you. Give me a second to figure out what I'm doing with Zoom. Just a minute. My apologies. I can't make this work. Uh, uh, thank you so much, and I really appreciate uh, the the discussion that's uh, that's uh, being had. Um, well, first of all, let me let me uh, thank uh, the the commissioners uh, for their time and 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 all the hours that they put in. Uh, I know that this was a, a very long process, and it was uh, it was not an easy process. It was. Uh, uh, quite a lengthy uh, amount of time that you spent uh, really dedicated and I, I really appreciate your dedication and uh, and your commitment to the work that that was being uh, done and to the really the 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 depth of the of the discussion uh, it it also caused uh, 
the council to have many conversations as, as you can see. Um, and I also really want to extend an appreciation to council member Esparza. I think we need to rename her as our, our historian of the council because uh, she, she's got uh, an unbelievable uh, memory that uh, allows me uh, to, to remember things that, uh, that had fallen off my radar uh, or, or I, I had kind of skipped some chapters and, and she really brings it back in for me and, and, and refocuses me. So I appreciate council member Esparza's uh, unbelievable recounting of uh, events as they unfolded. Uh, I'm rounding out my eight years. So sometimes it's difficult to remember absolutely every single thing that, that we did or, or, or how it, it took place. So I appreciate that. Um, so uh, thank you, council member uh, Jimenez and council member Cohen for your memo. Uh, I, I have to say that, um, you know, I, I agree with much that has been said on the council regarding uh, one particular item that for me has been of great concern. And, uh, and I've had uh, quite a, a bit of conversations and, and, uh, and, and that's uh, on the, on the uh, ranked choice uh, voting. And, and, and I, I wanna say this to the public, to all those that called in today. I appreciate the time that you spent on the phone waiting and, and getting on and, and giving your opinion. Uh, but, but it is very concerning to me as the representative of District 5, the east side of San Jose, uh, truly one of the poorest performing districts when it comes to uh, elections and when it comes to passing some of our measures. When we look at the entire city uh, as a whole, District 5 really struggles to pull out its voters for whatever reason. And we've, and we've done uh, a number of things to, to try and get our, uh, our voters to, to come out and to vote. And, and slowly we increase uh, those, uh, that voter participation. Uh, but one of the, the, the issues that we've had, in, and, and that includes even uh, the census, um, it, one is a language barrier cultural uh, uh, disconnect. Um, sometimes uh, uh, life gets in the way and, uh, and, and we're just uh, busy working, can't make it to the polls. Thank God that, uh, that we now have the uh, ballots that come directly to our house. It's made it easier. Uh, it's made it uh, more accessible. It's made it a lot more, um, uh, it's made it a lot more possible for us to engage. And I say us because uh, this is my community. These are my families. These are my neighbors. And so, uh, so I appreciate all of the efforts and all of the ways that we're looking to see how we increase voter participation. One of the ways that we're looking to see how we do that is also how we increase that voter participation when we're electing the, the highest ranking official in the city of San Jose, which is our mayor. And, uh, and we've seen from the studies, uh, we've seen from what uh, other cities have done, that by changing that election to a presidential cycle, that, that, it's, uh, that we're gonna get more voter participation. Uh, we had a very lengthy, uh, uh, sometimes unpleasant uh, debate on this council. Uh, nonetheless, it was provocative, it was, it was deep, it was, uh, was thought provoking. Um, and uh, not everyone was on this council, but but uh, but it it definitely was a uh, a, a very long several session uh, type of a conversation. But it was meant more than anything to figure out how we were going to increase voter participation. And uh, and I'm glad that uh, after all of the studies that have been uh, presented, that one of the ways, and I think it's one of the easiest ways, is by just simply moving the election to the presidential cycle. Uh, like, like Council Member Esparza, I'm dumbfounded by, by uh, the fact that uh, the council, the odd council uh, elections were not considered in terms of moving them. If we know that that increases voter participation, then I would imagine that that would also increase voter participation in the council races 
if we were to flip those districts uh, that we know have a low turnout, three, five, and seven, if we had done the exact same thing. Uh, and we know that the, the um, even numbered districts happen to be the districts that uh, are better off, uh, tend to be more educated, uh, have a higher income, et cetera, et cetera. And so we've also seen uh, that, um, that those tend to have higher uh, uh, voter engagement, District 10, District 6, District 8. They have very high voter participation. You don't struggle the way that we struggle in, in five, three, and, and seven, three, five, and seven. So, uh, so I'm, I'm just a little confused as to why the, the information that was presented didn't follow that kind of logic. So anyway, so we're, we're, we are where we are. Uh, I, I have to say, I haven't seen enough research to prove to me that, uh, that the ranked choice voting uh, is the, the panacea uh, to increase voter participation. I haven't seen it as the end all be all to uh, making sure that women, uh, communities of color, our senior citizens, uh, those with limited uh, English abilities, or those who are even new to the voter uh, world uh, are, are going to uh, have a, a, a thorough understanding as to how they can increase uh, or elevate their voices when they're choosing their candidate. In fact, I would think that um, that there might be actually an opportunity of ending up with a an individual that they weren't necessarily um, uh, it wasn't their number one, uh, as we've seen in some campaigns where uh, where people have a, a campaigned on on being number two, and this is the way that they uh, ended up winning the campaign. So. Um, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, I, I'm just not, uh, thoroughly convinced, uh, you know, furthermore, I, I want to say just as a person who is, uh, who's been for the last eight years representing a, a district with many challenges, this is just the last eight years, 25 years before that working in the same communities, uh, whether it was in district five, district seven or district three. I worked in these communities with families who were really struggling with so many other issues. Uh, simplicity, simplicity, simplicity is uh, the name of the game. You have to give families opportunities to engage in whatever it is that you want them to engage, whether it's voter participation or whether it's a parenting class. It, uh, the simpler you make it, the easier it is for people to participate. And I just uh, think that uh, having to go through such a sophisticated way of uh, voting is going to make it incredibly difficult. So I'm glad that we're bifurcating that. Um, I, I do have a question regarding number um, uh, number. By the way, thank you for number the recommendation number seven, uh, adding an acknowledgement uh, of our native land. Um, I, I think it's uh, uh, long overdue. Uh, but uh, number eight, if you could give me an understanding of what gender inclusive language is going to look like. Um, Council member Carrasco, Michelle McGurk here. Um, it could be as simple as changing a reference that says he or she to um, they. Uh, you know, it's really editing the document to not specify and use. It might be something, a reference to a committee having a chairperson rather than a chairman. Okay. Uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, very uh, uh, open to that. Um, I guess I'd like to know how you're going to deal with ethnic um, uh, terminology such as Latino, Latina. Filipino. I can do a quick search on the charter here and see if there's any reference in the charter to any um, language that might, I have it on my computer here. Um, I don't know that there's, there's nothing that 
is in the charter that refers to particular Anything. groups like that. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate you doing that so quickly. Uh, and of course, um, And of course, uh, just the, the policy recommendations. I know that in the memo that was introduced, um, those are going to be referred to the, to the roadmap. Uh, the one thing that I just wanna add regarding that, uh, you know, the policies that were addressed through the charter review, I, I really appreciate our commissioners taking that on. And, uh, and, you know, without having been there uh, specifically for all the meetings, my staff was there and of course uh, we sat down and we talked about it. But uh, these to me speak truly about how we're going to, as a city, really face head on uh, issues of equity. And uh, when, we, when I look at creating a climate action commission, uh, of course, I've been talking about the lack of canopy, greening the east side of San Jose, uh, how it's a heat uh, uh, island and how we're so much warmer uh, on the east side than, than you would find on other sides of the city. And, uh, and of course, uh, opportunities for families to be able to stay here and not be displaced or communities to be gentrified, opportunities to build permanency and make sure that their children have a legacy here in the city of San Jose. This speaks to me about equity. It speaks to me about uh, giving families truly an opportunity to continue to thrive both in terms of uh, economic stability and in terms of their health. And so I, I do hope that, uh, that as we move forward, we will look at that uh, through that lens. And I appreciate the commission having taken that on. Lastly, I introduced a memo uh, just this morning. I apologize for it being so late. Uh, it's come to my attention that there is one commission that is not aligned with the rest of the commissions. If, uh, if for whatever reason, we wanted to remove a commissioner uh, from uh, his, hers, or, or them's duties, their duties, um, uh, they, and I apologize for uh, not using that terminology correct. I, I will learn exactly how to use it. Uh, but uh, we're unable to because we that commission is uh, uh, governed by the charter. So there is very specific charter language. If we were ever to change that, this would be uh, the time uh, to do so. And simply what I'm asking in my memo is that we align the planning commission with the rest of the commissions and it gives us more uh, opportunity uh, and frankly control of who sits and who doesn't sit on the commission. And uh, so, um, and uh, Nora, we just, she just dropped off the meeting. Okay, well, um, well, when she gets back, we'll uh, let her continue. So I'm gonna go to Councilmember Perales. Uh, thank you. I've been having some connectivity issues as well, kind of windy, uh, but um, she hopefully my- She is back. Oh, all right, I'll, I'll pause. I'm sorry, my computer died on me. It has no <laughs> warning whatsoever, no mechanism. Nora, if you could just uh, give us a, a, a brief overview in terms of uh, what we have now in, uh, uh, for the planning commission. I'm sure, council member, thank you. The um, Charter currently provides, and this is in Charter Section 1000, that um, the council uh, may remove a member from office. This is a member of the Planning Commission um, at any time for misconduct, inefficiency, or willful neglect in the performance of the duties of his or her office. Um, and then there's a process that's included in the charter for that. So this charter section um, uh, limits the council's uh, ability to remove a member from the planning commission to certain acts in the performance of the duties of that office and not some of the more general language for the other commissions. Th thank you so much. And, and what, uh, what my memo is uh, requesting is that 
uh, staff come back with language appropriate uh, and be able to put this also on November's ballot in order to change that, uh, the, the, in order to make that charter amendment. So with that, I don't know if I need to make a friendly amendment uh, or just move my memo. That would be a friendly amendment. Uh, I'd like to ask for a friendly amendment to include my memo. No, I'm not going to accept it as a friendly amendment. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, David. Then uh, I'm going to make a substitute uh, uh, motion to include my memo along with the previous motion that was on the table. Second. All right, we have a um, up to motion that was moved and seconded. So that's the motion currently on the floor. Is that, uh, is that it, uh, Councilman Carrasco? That's it for me. Thank you so much, uh, Chair, or uh, thank you so much, uh, Vice uh, Mayor, and thank you so much, Councilmember Cohen, for not accepting my memo. Councilmember Perales. Yeah, thank you, uh, Vice Mayor. And um, I know we're, we're without our mayor today, but I do think it's his uh, birthday. So I'm gonna offer him a happy birthday. Um, and um, I wanted to first go to a little bit of a process question. Um, I know city staff had like a voting process set up, but we have a, a motion. Um, we've had some amendments. We've now got a substitute motion. It is, in my mind, it looks like it's superseding that process and it's kind of, cause it's even uh, going a little bit more detailed into some of the direction. Would that be correct? That we, are, we, are we eliminating that process at this point? Uh, Council Member Perales, Lee Wilcox. Yes, at this point with the motion on the floor and if you're able to work through the various recommendations, we would no longer need the prioritization process we were putting in place. Okay, great. It was, an, I guess, uh, maybe intuitive to try to understand that as we had a, a motion hit the floor, but um, I don't know how many of my colleagues were aware of that or certainly the members of the community, how much they were aware of what that process was going to look like. Um, and then in that regard, um, because it, it is getting a little nuanced on some of the different items, um, specifically now we, we, we have a substitute motion. So I'll start there with that one. Um, and I'll ask, I'll ask Councilmember Carrasco first, and then maybe staff. Uh, was there a place you were thinking about fitting that in? Were you thinking of recommending that as a standalone item, or potentially, say, fitting into the uh, what is it here? Recommendation six on the reforms of boards and commissions. Maybe squeezing that language in there. Uh, you know, uh, in terms of how the it would play out in the ballot, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, 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 I'm not the one that's going to draft the ballot, so I would leave it up to the uh, to staff to come back with it. Um, if uh, if that's where where it's most appropriate, then that that's where uh, I'm okay with it. Okay, I'll ask staff. Then I, I see that as a potential spot that that, that recommendation could fit into. Um, I know we're working on the fly here, but but curious on staff's response to that. Councilmember Perales, Lee Wilcox again. I would defer to Nora and Mark on the actual section of the charter where that existing language lies. Um, but I think if um, we're moving forward with a, a whole measure around recommendation six through 10, um, it obviously would be included in that measure. I'm not exactly sure the specific section of the charter um, that would change and would ask Nora to chime in there. Okay, but that, that more or less does answer that question of it would fit within that six through 10 uh, ballot language. I, I, I'll, I'll guess lead with that now. Um, I'm curious, staff's response, is, is there too much going on there? I know we've heard that from some of my colleagues. I would agree. I don't know if um, it, you know that's too much to be squeezing into one ballot uh, and or one initiative and, and hoping that our community members gather each component of that. Um, was that that's staff's thought as well? We would we'd be able to squeeze that much into one uh, initiative? 
So I think as we are changing the recommendations, it's something that we need to look at. Obviously, um, it's important that our 75 words and our descriptions are as transparent as possible. Um, and we're clear with the voters. Um, so I certainly think from a, a policy perspective, it makes sense um, that all of these are in one measure because it is you know, modernizing and updating the charter um, in a variety of areas that you know, overlap. Um, whether we can be totally clear in those 75 words in the discussion um, remains to be seen as we kind of work through that over the next several weeks. So then you would potentially come back and, and let us know, hey, we don't think we could, you know, fulfill the 75 word requirement and, and make this completely clear and we may need to split it up. That would, that, that's a potential outcome, you're saying? That is a potential outcome and that would be consistent with, um, you know, work that Michelle and I presented to you in 2018 where, where one of the measures became too much um, and one of the policy alternatives that we presented was to break it up and do two separate measures. So um, if, if directed to put all of this into one measure, that would certainly be in the back of our mind and something that if we felt we needed to do, we would recommend. But there, as I do wanna be clear, there is additional cost um, to that. Yeah, yeah, no, I recognize that, that each, each individual item would have its own cost. Um, I, I am at the moment trying to get an understanding of like how many this would actually turn into. And I guess we wouldn't know that today. We also wouldn't know it today because we haven't finished our study sessions on some of the other conversations like um, expanding uh, non-citizen voting and uh, the, the, the laundry list of recommendations within police oversight and reforms and our reimagining um, task force is not through with their recommendations either. And I, I know timing may impact some of these to where they wouldn't make it to the, the ballot anyways in November. So that may not, not be a, a major issue, but um, I still would be very interested in seeing where we end up with how many uh, initiatives we, we, we have on the ballot. And the concern is, is confusion to voters and uh, you know, down ballot fatigue with voters. It just uh, really, we're, we're only talking about our own potential changes and in initiatives. We're not talking about what the rest of uh, the jurisdictions all the way up to the state, right? And federal government, uh, everything that would be included. And so I, I am legitimately concerned that that's a, that's a real issue. And uh, I appreciate comments from council member Esparza in regards to wanting to, to potentially recommend some of these, um, like the ranked choice voting, not for this election cycle, but a couple of years from now, when we would be having a presidential election as well. Uh, and I do think there's merit there in regards to some of these pretty significant changes. Would we, would we want more voters to turn out for them? And I would agree uh, that we would. And I'm not completely sold on everything here. I, I I am willing to move forward on something that I'm not totally sold on. For instance, like ranked choice voting, um, I'm, I'm, I haven't sort of taken a side on this one way or the other. I've been doing some homework on it as well as it came up through the Charter uh, Revision Commission and, um, and and have heard the conflicting arguments. I think uh, we heard Councilman Member Esparza make some strong ones and I know Councilman Cohen was saying that, um, you know, he has a potentially, uh, he maybe he'll share those uh, later, but. Uh, some of the, the, the opposing arguments to that. I, I have heard and seen that as well. And most importantly, I think I, I just haven't been bought and sold that, that that is going to be something that we should implement. But even if I landed at that point, uh, I would not necessarily be against putting it to a ballot for our voters to decide, uh, because ultimately that's who it's up to. Uh, I would agree though that uh, we, we want to be considered of when, and uh, I would be much more interested in regards to uh, a later date. Did that get accepted into the original direction? Uh, I, I, was it a, I don't know, Councilmember as far as if that was a friendly amendment you made and if that was accepted? No, yeah, well, because uh, it was uh, bifurcated. So that's going to come up and when we talk oh, well, about it separately. Okay. So we're not talking about that just yet. <laughs> oh. That's correct. Okay. Um, so we'll vote on that one maybe second. Okay. Um, but the, the, my understanding of Councilmember Esparza's comments were that 
she wouldn't support it unless that was accepted. And I, I would agree with that. So once we get to that, um, that'd be the, the, the stance that I would have as well. Um, I actually do agree with having um, the establishment of, of future charter review commissions. And, uh, you know, I'm not necessarily hooked on what the, the date might be. I know 10 years sounded like a, a good number and, and I, I appreciated the, the commission's input on that. Um, I, you know, it had been so long since we'd had one previously. Where, where I'm nervous about is that, you know, years to come and the council doesn't necessarily take advantage of that. I, I will tell you as a council member, I was not aware that that was something that we could call up. And it wasn't until we had a pretty lengthy and heated debate uh, over the summer a couple years ago, where I learned about that opportunity and learned that that was historically where we made pretty significant charter changes, um, and especially to our, our structure of government, and, uh, and made the recommendation at that point to do so, ultimately what, what started this whole process, what got us going down this. But I would say it didn't seem as though that that was something that, that the council was, was ready or willing to, to, to enact um, as needed, which is what we're, we're recommending here. And I think um, Councilmember Cohen is suggesting that we, we eliminate that as a requirement. And I know staff was saying as well that, hey, you, you know, the council can pull together this commission whenever it wants. I just don't think that that's, uh, hasn't been the reality though of what this council has done. And uh, again, uh, uh, for whatever reason, I know what my own personal reason is. I didn't know that that opportunity existed uh, for the first number of years I was in office. So I do think it's valuable to have something as important as, as you, and, and I think we all see the laundry list of recommendations that uh, have been brought forward. Um, I'd rather not have it be where it appears as though, you know, we wait until it's like a volcano, right? And it just, it, it erupts and we've got a list and list of things that people want to change in the charter. And, and now we run into this conflict. If I think if we had a regular cycle, say every 10 years, then we would have a better conversation and there would be less items I think we'd be discussing and it's just a recognition of the fact that that um, you know there, there there should be some periodic look at how we want to update our charter so I actually would prefer that that get included and um, I'm not necessarily I don't think that has to be a now we're not doing the <laughs> we're not doing the 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 ranking of, of voting so I wouldn't necessarily say hey we have to do that now but I, I, I would like that to come forward. I would like this council to approve that, being that this Charter Review Commission uh, recommended it. But I don't necessarily think that has to come forward now on the ballot this coming year or this year. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask uh, Council Member Carrasco at this point, uh, you have the motion. Uh, would you be comfortable of re-including that recommendation number two with the caveat that, that it doesn't have to come forward for this ballot, uh, but I would like for it to, to uh, be included on a future ballot. Uh, and it could be you know, two years from now. I'm actually, I don't, I don't think it necessarily has to because we're talking about something that happens every 10 years. So I think we have a little bit of time with this one, but at least that it wouldn't have to come this year. Would you be comfortable with that friendly amendment? Am I on mute? Yeah, you are. I can hear you now. So, so your recommendation is to get it on for what year? Uh, I actually not suggesting a year. If, I, if, if you'd like me to, I, would, I could suggest two years from now. Um, but I'm just saying, I don't think that that one has to happen this year. There's no rush on, on recommendation two. So, yeah, okay. okay, that's fine. I'll accept it. Thank you. Is that okay with the seconder? Yes, in fact, um, it might be tied uh, for the... Um, Oh gosh, um, the 2025, where are we? Um, return to the council about the appropriate size, like just to tie that in there. Uh, so that mid, mid sort of uh, mid census between our, our census uh, 10 years uh, mm -hmm. to kind of check in and include that. So that makes sense. I'm, I'm, and I'm fine with that. Uh... With that, with that specificity, is that okay, Councilmember yeah. Uh, Carrasco? Yeah. Okay. That, that's fine. Thank can you. you. Um, can you repeat that again, just so I understand? Yeah. So, uh, if I understood it correctly, let me know, Councilmember Esparza. But we we had a recommendation 
uh, three, which was uh, as discussed, I believe in the in the, the current motion that we would actually come back to have a discussion on that to put go on a future ballot and that discussion would happen um, for a ballot in, in, in 20 coming after 2025. And so Councilmember Sparza is now saying, as I've asked for the recommendation two to be re-included, which is the Charter Review Commission coming onto being uh, required every 10 years, that that come back at that same time. It's number four on the Cohen Jimenez memo, if that helps anyone. It does help, thank you. Got it, thank you. Thank you. And I'm sorry for our clerk, hopefully there's, there's, there's gotta be a seventh or eighth and rendition, rendition of the, the notes at this point on the motion. Um, so, uh, and then actually, as far as expanding the council to, to 14 districts, I, I, I actually don't support that, but I would be comfortable with that discussion coming back. I, I do think the 14 is too, too many. Um, I, I did have a question for uh, our chair. Is, is he still here, Fred? Yes, he's here. Hi, Fred. See you coming down. Yes, Council Member. Hi, th thank you for, for your service and for being here through the discussion. We're, uh, and if you could speak for the commission, were, were you as commissioners aware of some of the, what, what staff just presented in regards to um, what it looked like for a council member um, back then with, you know, maybe one, only one staff, minimal budget, um, and that there are other things have come in to augment the, you know, the, the, the council members that serve the district as the numbers have gone up, population's gone up? Um, yes, council member, we spent a lot of time in this discussion and this came back to the commission twice. It went back to the subcommittees after further discussion and came back again. Again, what we're looking at is how can a council member really be able to represent more and more people? And if you go back to those early days, there was a lot of things that were different in terms of the staffing of this city, but there was just less people there for folks to be represented. If you're looking at more diversity and more issues that are coming, folks in the community are saying, I'm not feeling heard. And so trying to expand the council itself. One of the things that the commission did was we chose the number 14 because we asked the, the subcommittee looking at this to come up with a number. Because if you just say expand, then it becomes a like, well, but how many? So there was no magic in the 14, but what we were trying to do is say, if we used a criteria like the old census data when the 75,000 uh, folks, then maybe that would be, whenever that, that uh, metric is hit, then you would expand the district, uh, the, the number of districts. I do think though the challenge is really trying to understand what does it really mean to expand inclusion in terms of representation? So when uh, folks brought up things like, well, the dais isn't fit for 14, that to me, that the, count, the commission did not think those were the kinds of arguments that were really valid. If you're really talking about the expansion of inclusion and representation, how do you become more representative? So there were budget concerns, but again, the commission felt like that is the best way to spend money is to really understand how do we represent our, our community better uh, and especially those folks in those districts where that felt not represented well um, in the current way of looking at equity and within the city. So there's no magic to the 14. We did believe that the census and redistricting, and that's why we're looking at having the commission be in charter to start every 10 years, but it would start in the eighth year for those two years before redistricting. So all the issues that would come from the community would come in that first year, that second year could be looked at how do we develop the, the ideas, the plans, the suggestions, the recommendations, and then that would be ahead of redistricting so that any of the charter amendment uh, ideas would go to redistricting before that. So we did believe in that same timeline you're suggesting, which is that we're talking about the next census, but what are those things that we want in place to make sure that that happens rather than wait till then and then it doesn't actually happen. I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah, it does help. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and. I, I, I think that for me, when I looked at this, because I do agree that in certain circumstances with certain districts, uh, it's not equitable and, and it's, you know, it's much more challenging. For instance, I know Councilmember Carrasco and I share this conversation um, often throughout the years in regards to the number of, of gang hotspots, for instance, that we have or 
extremely low income neighborhoods, violent neighborhoods. I know Councilmember Esparza uh, fits in that category. And we, we talk about this with things like the, the significant um, development of, of low income housing um, in certain districts and not others. And I think that for me, this where at least this item was 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 going, um, I actually felt that there's a, a, a better way of, of getting there and that this sort of expanding the, the council districts, but still having the same number of constituents per district actually doesn't doesn't solve the equity issue. It's that's a, an equality solution that just says, well, let's just shrink everybody and, and, and then that'll help. Yes, that's true, but it actually is not going to help in regards to the districts or the neighborhoods that need it the most. And I know Councilmember uh, Carrasco brought this up uh, recently, where the idea could be: Do we actually, rather than than look at the the number of constituents, because we're we have that today uh, based on the the census, where we're more or less required that, but that census doesn't say well everybody gets the same amount of uh, you know challenging neighborhoods, low-income communities, or uh, communities that have higher levels of violence, uh, there's, you know, that's, a, that's a, an impossible task. But what we can do that is possible is allocate, al allocate more equitable resources to the districts that need it. And we can utilize those measures to do so. We can look at the things like, well, how many gang hotspot areas do you have? How many low-income uh, housing projects do you have? Um, how many homeless encampments or population, what is the population of the homeless in, in, in your community? And look at these real numbers that we know drive real community need, calls for service, uh, a, a higher level of, of responsiveness from the council office that not every council district has. And in my mind, we could do that. Um, and, and that would be a, a better way of, of being more equitable in how our each council district is served. Uh, versus just just lowering the, the overall constituency um, in each district by by adding some more council members. So that's why I didn't um, I, I don't I haven't really thought that was the right approach. Um, but again, I'm you know I, I'm I'm one opinion here, and I think that if we wanted to move forward with that in a future ballot, uh, I was okay with that. So I think as the motion stands, I'm I'm fine with that. But I, I do think that there may be a better way to resolve that in the years to come, and and maybe that doesn't end up on a on a ballot at some point. Um, Last question was in regards to the native land acknowledgement. Uh, and I know council member Foley asked this question. I just wanted to reiterate it with, with city staff. Could you, could you reiterate what, what the challenge was there? You mentioned that there was sort of a last minute um, appeal or there was some, so it, was this from other native groups? And, and, and if you could just walk me through that a little bit better on, on what, what happened there. We're going to ask Fred to talk about it. As Perfectly chair. fine. Yeah, thanks, Fred, for coming back down. Thank you. Sure. Um, so we worked with a subcommittee worked with our local um, Native American community to be able to they at, we asked them to help draft the actual land acknowledgement. They testified before the commission. Um, it went back and forth with um, pretty good consistency. We got great public feedback. There are a number of professors that are working with them uh, from Stanford, for example, who also kind of verified it. So we felt really good about this was a strong recommendation. We thought we had done an authentic and, and transparent process with the community of our local um, Native American community. And at the very end, when we were about to vote, there was one individual who claimed uh, a challenge, challenged the, um, the legitimacy of that. We had the Stanford professor at that time then um, came back and said, kind of reiterated the legitimacy of the process of what we had and the recommendation. So there was only one individual member who, um, person who actually um, was against that. And then, so the commission had the ability at that point to say, oh wait, let's do something different. But after we heard their additional testimony, we continued on and the vote was taken and was, and was passed with a strong support. So I don't know if there's other communities that the city staff has recognized or have been come to them, but as you heard from the testimony to, today as well, um, there wasn't any other um, testimony against moving forward except from that one individual to the commission. And again, I don't know what the staff came back with, but that's the experience that we had at the commission level. It wasn't, there wasn't controversy at all, except at the end with this one person. 
Thank you, Fred. That 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 does help highlight things. Is there anything else that staff wanted to add? Was there somebody else or other groups that came forward or, or other concerns you had? Because it, 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 it read as such that there was greater concerns in the memo. Um, council member, no, we just staff understands that this is a very important process. And um, because we as staff had not been engaged with it, it was a subcommittee of the commission, the Office of Racial Equity had not been involved, city manager's office had not been involved. We just wanted to be very cautious in our recommendation, um, rather than saying that this acknowledgement is, you know, it hadn't gone through the process we would normally go through um, to bring something to council. It was coming directly from the commission to council. So we were just being very cautious in our staff report and um, wanting to, um, you know, it hadn't gone through, uh, we hadn't had public hearings of the council or of council committees. And so, um, and, and hadn't, you know, we outlined what we would do if we were to engage in this process. Um, and, and so it wasn't in any way a critique of the work of the Charter Review Commission. It was just an acknowledgement that the, they had so much work that they were doing. Um, and, and it was an independent process. And now we were looking at it and not knowing all of the factors. So hopefully that is helpful to you, Council Member. Yeah, that, that's helpful. And it, it makes sense. I mean, staff didn't do this work. So you you couldn't necessarily put your stamp of, of approval on it in the same way maybe you would have done it. Um, but uh, but but we as the council can decide on that uh, if we do or not. And, and I, so I, I am comfortable with, with that recommendation from the commission. And uh, and lastly, I do agree, and I know it's in the motion, which is was to eliminate recommendation 11. Um, and thank you to Joe, uh, our auditor, for for the explanation on that. I, I do agree with that. Uh, those are my comments. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. I was just informed that uh, Council Member Carrasco's memo um, cannot be heard today because it wasn't uh, part of the agenda and the topic of discussion. So we're going to have to refer it to rules. Uh, so I just wanted to make everybody aware of that. So obviously that impacts the substitute motion, but I know there were some other changes uh, to the mm -hmm. substitute motion. So Councilman- Vice Mayor? Oh, yes. Could could you give me some clarification on that? Was that, uh, were you informed by? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll have Nora give you the legal and answer. Thank you, Vice Mayor and Council Member Carrasco. Uh, the section for uh, agenda item 3.1 is limited to recommendations from the San Jose Charter Review Commission. Um, so Council Member, your uh, language could, can't, can't uh, isn't properly noticed for today. Um, you could uh, either have the language go to rules, which I think is probably the better way to do it and just have it come forward with all of these other recommendations um, if approved by rules, um, or it's possible to, to do a request to the city manager and, and my office, but I think it's the, the safer way in terms of the Brown Act to bring this forward given that the current agenda is tied to the recommendations from the Charter Review Commission would be to um, have all of, uh, to, to have your proposed amendment come forward with the other items, whatever gets voted on today to um, uh, come back to council for consideration that uh, those items that were recommended by the Charter Review Commission, uh, the, your issue in your blue memo could come forward with those uh, coming out of rules. It could be put on that agenda and we can work with that language. But because the agenda today is tied to recommendations from the San Jose Charter Review Commission, that's the, the better approach. Okay, so you're saying that the better approach is to 
get us through the uh, through rules, or or would you say to uh, refer it to uh, CMO? Um, it, either way, but rules is the is really technically the the better way, and it could and it could come through rules to come back on the same date as everything else. Yeah, it, yeah. If I could just jump in, I think we would need direction as a city manager's office to pursue this by the council. So, uh, council member Lee Wilcox, happy to help um, with that memorandum at rules with the with the needed language. So you can bring that forward if you wanted to go that way. Okay, we'll go ahead and do that. And same with our office, council member. So do you want to revise the motion to um, move your memo to rules and approve the previous motion on the table, along yeah. with the friendly amendments you've accepted from Perales? Yes, we'll go ahead and do that. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you, uh, council member Cohen. I did see Councilmember Mahan's hand is up. So you want to go to him first since he hasn't spoken yet? Councilmember Mahan. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate that, Councilmember. Um, thanks to, I'll, I'll add my thanks to the commissioners and city staff who supported the process. I know it was an exhaustive and probably exhausting process for everybody involved, but uh, the, the thoughtfulness uh, certainly shines through in the document. Um, I'll, I'll be brief because a lot has already been said and I appreciate all my colleagues' comments. I, I do have some concerns about the, the motion on the floor, not, um, not, not related to Councilor Carrasco's substitute at all, but just the uh, couple of the elements of what I understand we're voting on. On, on ranked choice voting, my personal view is that um, academically, it, it is, it is uh, and mathematically, it is, is a fairer and better way to vote, but of course we know in practice, things don't always work as well as our academic or, or mathematic models may suggest. And so my, my view has always been that ranked choice voting is, um, is, is a good system to move toward if it's accompanied with a lot of education and community engagement and is done very thoughtfully and, and deliberately. And so if, if moving this to 2024 allows us to do that, fine. I, I will say personally, I actually liked staff's model and i and i do appreciate I, I very much appreciate council members cohen and jimenez putting together a starting point for us I, I do think that's generally a helpful thing to do so i i don't mean to undermine that at all but i i just whether it's moving it to 2024 or it's calling this next meaning that we're going to have more discussion and deliberation as a council and gain a better understanding that would that would be uh my preference because i do think we have to be very thoughtful about how we move it forward though again um, in the abstract, I've, I've always been a supporter of ranked choice voting and I've used it. I lived in San Francisco and voted with it. Um, so there are, I, I do think there are some advantages if you can implement it properly. So I want to share that. that, that makes me concerned about that first part of the motion that we'd be voting on. And then on the remainder, I, I thought council member Davis brought up great questions. And, and while I, I, I support uh, at least in spirit, the various things we might be moving together. I, I also have a hard time imagining how we would do these uh, four or five recommendations justice in a single 75 word ballot me uh, measure and message. Um, so I guess the question for staff on that is if we were to, if, if that passes and we move that forward to the ballot, can you just clarify again what the next step would be, what we would see, and what options we would have? And, and let me just say before you answer, to, to me, as I read the five recommendations that could be potentially bundled together here, some feel more straightforward in the, in the sense that they are language changes, and others feel a bit more substantive and may have other more significant implications that we haven't really discussed as a council. So if I were using the staff model here, I probably would have said next, as in I would like more council discussion before we agree to put it on the ballot. Given that the motion on the floor is to move it to the ballot this November, I would like to understand what further options for discussion we would have as a council. Council Member Mahan, Lee Wilcox. Um, first, you know, I, I think your division of, of all of these um, is probably accurate. The process for us um, next is to do 
the research we need and, and, and work with the attorney's office to develop the 75 words and the accompanying charter changes, um, we would be bringing that forward to you, as I, I stated earlier, sometime in June. Um, and that would be your decision point, whether you place it on the ballot or not. Um, part of our analysis, however, um, as I said before, I think would be, does all of this fit within one measure? So we could develop 75 words in one measure, um, or to be frank, we could be coming to you as saying, that's not feasible, here's two measures, or provide a policy alternative where there's two. So I think we'll be doing that research to make sure either A, all of this can fit in one measure successfully and still be clear and transparent, or off, offer two measures um, for your consideration that achieve that goal. Thank you. What was the timing again on that? Uh, ultimately, we'd like to do this by the end of June. Um, so the, either the third or fourth meeting in June, we'd be bringing these forward. And I can feel the rest of my team staring at me as I say that, because I know that's a tight turnaround, but um, we're going to attempt to do that. Okay. Um, I, I guess personally, I'm I'm open to moving the conversation to that point and discussing our options and, and pros and cons. I, I do share the concerns outlined by Councilmember Davis on whether or not we're actually gonna be able to put all those together and whether or not we should. But um, it, it sounds like there would be ample opportunity for us to discuss and debate that and make a, a final decision. So I, I guess I'm okay with the second half. As I understand the motion on the floor, I just wanna maybe clarify it, chair or the maker of the motion. There are two components right now. We have bifurcated ranked choice voting. I've expressed at least my concern with doing that without ample time and investment in community engagement and education. And then the second piece is everything else that's been discussed. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you again uh, to all my colleagues for the uh, robust conversation. And thanks to our commissioners for the great work that you all did. That's all for me. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Council Member Cohen. Uh, Council Member Jimenez is behind you. Do you want to let him? My question was answered. It had okay. to do with the other motion that sort of went away or the other part of it. So. All right. So, Council Member Cohen, you're on. All right. Thank you. Um, I want to, I, it's been the robust discussion that I expected. So, I, I thank all my colleagues for it. And I knew that this was no, these were not easy decisions and not an easy discussion to have. So, I appreciate all of the input. Um, I um, do want to mention just a couple of things before I talk a little bit more about ranked choice voting. Um, there was there was a recommendation about a climate action commission, which I think we can implement as a council. I like to pref I prefer to call it a sustainability commission if we do it. Um, I also think it it fits that perhaps that could be part of our recommendation coming out of our discussion on June seventh as we talk about trying to be carbon neutral by twenty thirty that we might that might be one of our strategies is to implement. A commission to help um, the community achieve that goal. So, uh, not necessarily asking for a specific recommendation on that today, but just to plant the seed that that's a reason, a good conversation to have on June seventh. Um, as far as council size, I know there's a lot of back and forth. I I think I think that th there's a legitimate question to answer simply about what is an optimal size and how do you best serve people and how do you get people who are willing to serve. And this ties in to one of the key issues that I think also ranked choice voting addresses, which is it's a very difficult challenge for people to run for office um, when you have such a large district. If you wanna open up the um, pool of candidates, you want to make it uh, something that's doable for people to be able to, to participate. And if you make it so expensive and so large and so time consuming, it's hard for people, for example, with jobs or without the resources to be able to compete against other candidates. So it, to me, that's an important part of the consideration. Um, and this ties into ranked choice voting as well, because I've talked, we've talked a lot about the effect on voters, um, although there's a lot of studies and I'll, that I'll get into about um, the improvement of voter turnout. Um, but what we also know from the, from the experiences in other cities is that it's been shown to boost candidates um, and, and elected officials that get elected from communities of color. Um, people who don't have to commit to an entire year-long cycle with a primary and a general election um, are more likely to, to run for office. People don't have to raise money for two cycles in order to win are more likely to run, off, run for office. So 
Yes, there's a cost savings to the city of $3 million each election cycle. There's also a cost savings to candidates to have a single cycle of rent rank choice voting. And the studies are very clear that you get more candidates communities of color. And in fact, one of the studies showed that due to the, having more candidates of color running, you actually get a boost in turnout of, of voters from those communities in the places that have done it. Um, because they're more likely to see people that they want to vote for running for office. Um, there was a 2018 study um, that was done that showed a 9% increase in the number of candidates for minority communities. Um, a 2016 study found larger increases in the number of candidates, community of color. So there's two couple studies there. Um, and then a 2019 study asked voters about, um, from, from all backgrounds, about their understanding and engagement with ranked choice voting. And it showed little evidence of racial and ethnic differences in their understanding um, of ranked choice voting. And there's also a substantial body of research showing that voters don't have trouble understanding ranked choice voting across ethnic lines um, and, and for various other uh, demographic measures. Um, same goes for turnout. A study in Minneapolis before and after implementing ranked choice voting found no increase in turnout disparity between white voters and voters of color. A 2016 study of San Francisco similarly found no decrease in Latino turnout after ranked choice voting was implemented. Um, studies also often point, um, like I said, communities of color are more likely to vote uh, when candidates from their communities run. Um, and the more candidates of color have been winning elections in places with ranked choice voting. I will say that there's one, one set of data that does um, bear out some of the things that have been said. For senior voters, there is slight evidence to show a slight negative impact on senior voters that seem to suppress turnout a little bit. Um, the studies, those same studies show a very large increase in young voters. And we've had a big issue, of course, in our elections of not having a uh, significant young voter turnout. And um, I think one of our objectives has always been to try to increase young voter participation. So studies show that this can be helpful. Um, exit polls from Santa Fe uh, in the most recent election showed that there was overwhelming support from voters to continue using ranked choice voting. Um, and in fact, the first ranked choice voting mayoral election in Santa Fe had a historically high turnout. So there's no evidence there that turnout was suppressed. Um, and I, I have faith in that the voters in San Jose, just like they are in other cities, uh, will have no trouble understanding ranked choice voting. Having said that, I understand that this is a new, um, this is new for people. And when things are new, they're a little bit um, unsettling and difficult for people uh, to, to wrap their head around. And just like it took two years for us to sort of come to consensus on moving the mayoral election, you know, that was brought up a couple years ago. And, and uh, we finally, I think we had a pretty overwhelming support for putting it on the ballot this year now after two years of working towards building that consensus. I think it's very reasonable to spend a couple years building consensus around this issue as well. So, you know, if it, had, if it were still my motion, I at this point would accept the uh, friendly amendment to move the to put off this item to 2024. I think the motion still includes that as a now. So I will ask the current holder of the motion, um, she'll accept the friendly amendment at this point to move the uh, that item to 2024 for potential ballot measure then. What is your, your request, uh, Council Member Cohen? On the item for ranked choice voting, the motion on the floor was that you that you rolled into your motion was um, still the language in the memo that says um, bring a ranked choice voting ballot measure for this year's election, and I'm asking to defer that to 2024 for potential ballot measure two years from now. And, and I thought it was uh, bifurcated. Well, it's bifurcated, but I'm well. Okay, so it's two. I'm asking it all together. We can vote separately, but <laughs> it's a bifurcated motion. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Councilmember Cohen, can we just keep that okay. separate? We'll keep that separate and so, just vote on. The motion on the floor, and then we can yeah, I take take up the. Comments. I was trying to save time without talk. I, I appreciate voice. that. Okay, so that's that's fine. So I'm I'm <laughs> I'm done with my comments, and I'm happy that we've reached a point. I think that we can all agree on uh, on bulk of the items for the Charter Review Commission. Great, thank you. So we have a uh, substitute motion on the floor, which is not to vote on rank choice voting, but on everything else on in the motion. And I see Councilmember Foley has her hand hand raised. So Councilmember Foley. Yes, just a clarification. Did it include so we're voting on the substitute motion less the planning commission addition. 
Is that correct? So it, it added back in the friendly amendment or includes a friendly amendment from uh, council member Perales. Is that what we're voting on? Yes, that does include that friendly amendment. Okay. Yeah, but Just wanted to clarify. It is officially moving it to rules though. So no, we're not talking about the, the planning commission. Oh yeah, no. I'm sorry. Yeah. You're absolutely correct. It's going to move it to rules. Got it. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. All right. Any other questions? Um, Council Member Arenas. Thank you. I'm supporting the motion on the floor. I know that there, the conversation has already been very rich. And I'm, um, I, I, I agree with some of my uh, council colleagues in, in terms of how it's been the motion is shaping up. Um, I wanted to just thank uh, a lot of the community that has come out to um, speak on uh, the different aspects of, of the work that we're, we have before us today. And with that, I, I know that it reflects a lot of the hopes and dreams for our city, um, especially embracing equity and having that as, as a principle um, that we move forward with regardless of whether, I don't know that, that um, we need to always think about, well, what will it cost the city um, in terms of equity? Because I think what we have seen so far is that cost to our community um, in terms of having uh, generational poverty uh, inherited uh, within communities and especially communities of color. And so I want us to make sure that we always make um, our decisions, not only just based on, on principle, um, but, but also um, taking a look at the past policies and how we are undoing some of those past policies. And not to say that we are not going to be fiscally responsible. Of course, that's the commitment that we have to our, our community. Um, to make sure that we we are responsible with their taxpayer money. We also have to make sure that those investments that we make now will benefit generations to come um, and undo some of those policies that have come before us. And so I'm really proud of the work that we're doing. I'm uh, absolutely proud of our commissioners who um, have brought so much before us. Um, so much that we have to bifurcate and, and, and to, you know, we just have to scaffold some of these conversations uh, because there's just so much to discuss. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for, for their uh, proactive conversations and taking a look at our city as a whole. Um, I'd also just uh, want to thank our, our chair, um, Commissioner Fred uh, Ferrer, as well as the commissioners in my district, Maria Fuentes and Jerry Bruce. Thank you so much for all the really great work. I'm sure that uh, many of my, uh, many of those folks serving are just as wonderful. And, and thank you for the service that you've provided our city. Um, and, and that's really all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, council member. And I don't see any other hands raised or any names on the, on the board, so. Tony, we have a, uh, a motion. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? No. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Foley? Aye. Mahan? No. Jones? Aye. Thank you, motion passes eight to two. All right. So we have a, um, a bifurcated motion on the floor, which is the, the conversation on uh, ranked choice voting. And I, I just wanna um, start out by, you know, I haven't really uh, expressed my position on ranked choice voting. And I, I wanna commend actually council member Esparza I think she was very eloquent in her um, feelings and description about ranked choice voting. Uh, I also wanna commend Tony for your analysis Sorry. with all the, the pros and cons. And I think that uh, you brought out a lot of strong points. You know, you brought out points for and you brought out points against. Uh, 
and we could probably get, get engaged in doing um, polls and doing surveys, but I also know what I see when I vote every election. And what I see are ballots that have numerous um, elections, numerous um, you know, propositions, numerous you know, ballot measures, and it just goes on and on and on. And one of the things that you learn, particularly in the world of business, is more options creates more complexity. And so intuitively, you know, someone who is engaged in, in the, uh, the voting process, you know, our residents who vote every, every election cycle and have to go through these very, again, extensive ballots, it's just counterintuitive that if you layer on more complexity, that it's gonna be easier for the voters. Um, Council member uh, Esparza brought up the issue in terms of uh, gaming the system. I remember when we were, um, at least I was up in arms, and I know a lot of uh, other folks that I know were up in arms during the San Francisco election, where two of London Breed's uh, competitors colluded to game the system to try to you know, get one of them elected over London Breed, who had you know, the most votes. Uh, we also uh, are familiar with what happened in Oakland with Gene Kwan, who was elected, you know, uh, under ranked choice voting. And, you know, conventional wisdom is that it really hampered her ability to govern the city of Oakland, and it led to her not being reelected because she did not have a majority of the voters and the majority of the support. And I'm sure, you know, if you go into some of these other cities that are engaged in ranked choice voting, I'm sure you could come up with other examples. Uh, and I'm sure you could also come up with examples like Councilmember Cohen came up with in terms of the benefits. I, you know, sometimes question some of these polls, you know, because again, you know, I know what I read, but I also know what I see. And, you know, it's often brought up that, you know, these initiatives or processes you know, benefit communities of color. And, you know, again, I just wanna know who they're, they're talking to or who they're polling because, you know, if you go out into the community and you explain ranked choice voting, you're gonna have people who are just gonna throw up their hands and say, hey, you know, this is way more complicated. I just wanna be able to go into the voting booth and vote for a candidate and, and hope that they win. So again, I'm sure we can come up with surveys and polls and studies that can support whatever position we wanna take. But as, as you know, people who understand human nature, it, it's, it's really counterintuitive. So I, I've never been a supporter of ranked choice voting. Uh, again, I think it just makes things too complicated. We're trying to encourage people to come out and vote. And when you make the process more and more complicated, you're intuitively discouraging people from, from participating. So that's, that's why I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, again, I think uh, Council Member Cohen, you know, you made some good points, but again, I just don't think that it matches the reality that we see every day. So I can't, I can't support uh, the motion. And um, I just hope that if it goes forward that, you know, there's an expectation that we're gonna dedicate you know, a lot of resources to educate and train the community to be able to vote. And if you have a process where it's gonna require additional resources for people to be able to do something, then you really should question why we're doing this process. So that's all I have to say on that. So again, I, I, I would not support you know, the, the motion on the floor. And I see but Council Member Carrasco. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you could see my hand. I, I was having trouble yeah, I see uh, it. raising it. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, I really appreciate uh, you saying, uh, uh, you making the, these last uh, final statements uh, because I think that they're really important. I'm not going to support uh, this motion uh, for all of the reasons and so much more, uh, for all the reasons that you just stated and for so much more. Uh, you know, I, I again, uh, for whatever it's worth, uh, I've, I've represented a district for the past almost eight years in this capacity, but I've worked in this district and in District 3 and in District 7 
and and in district eight the 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 areas that uh have had many many challenges uh actually i've worked throughout the entire city of san jose and throughout the county of santa clara county and, and i will tell you that uh you said it you said it best simplicity is best and and this is a very complicated way of voting and uh you know uh uh, I guess I appreciate what Council Member Cohen said that everybody understands it. I don't agree with that. Uh, I, I myself have a very difficult time understanding the logic behind it and how I'm going to actually get my my uh, choice voted into power uh, when I have to strategize. It's like uh, playing chess almost. Uh, and and I think that uh, for someone who has worked for the almost three decades, I've worked almost three decades. I know I'm dating myself, but I'm very proud that just a few days ago, I turned 55. So for almost three decades, I've worked campaigns. I've worked campaigns for the Senate. I've worked local campaigns. I've worked campaigns in uh, some of the toughest areas in California, like Los Angeles. And I have worked mostly in communities of color. It's a little insulting to have someone from a district that does not have the kind of population that I've been working with tell me that they know better or that they've got all this body of research that tells them uh, con something contrary to what I've experienced, what I have uh, lived through for the almost uh, 30 years, uh, what I have seen. And if, if it were that simple, then I invite you to come over and solve this voter engagement problem that we've had uh, historically. I mean, you should have ran for mayor, Council Member Cohen, truly, uh, because it sounds like you've got all the answers. Uh, and I'm telling you, it's insulting. Uh, when you go out and you interact with the community and you engage with the community, then you can come back and you can tell me, hey, people of color, people who have uh, lower incomes, people who are really, you know, interested in, in having some sort of say so in the political process, but don't know how to engage, I've managed to get them engaged, then we can go ahead and have a real conversation. But uh, throwing these numbers and these stats and these uh, research papers at me uh, without having the lived experiences is really insulting. So I'm going to vote no on it. Thank you so much for bringing the memo forward. It's a no. Thank you, Councilmember Carrasco. As the second oldest person on the council, you're still just a baby. All right. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you're not saying oh, who the oldest is on the council. I'm yet, not. So thank you. No, I did not. <laughs> Councilmember Perales. Can we just uh, clarify what the actual motion is right now? Uh, Council Member Cohen, do you want to? Well, it, it was the motion, but yeah. It was I mean, it, it's it's to to move item one of of Council Member Jimenez and my memo with uh, moving it to. I guess we would just change it to say with, with instead of saying for this year, it would just say for twenty. Bring it back in twenty twenty four to discuss to to consider placing it on the ballot for for. Maybe that year or future year or something like, I mean, it's just for bringing back the discussion in 2024 for potential ballot measure. Okay. So that, that, that is a change from the original. That was, well, that so, was the change that I, that, well, yeah. did, there will be a I mean, you, you actually, I, I shouldn't say that I asked for that. And then you said that we, that wasn't the right time to ask for it. So I guess we haven't actually made that change to the motion, right? That's correct. <laughs> so you're making it down. You're making it now. I, I, yeah. I mean, that, that's, that was the, that was the, change I asked for before and to the main to the motion. Okay, so and it's your motion. It's your motion. So oh, it's my motion. Okay, well, then I'll make the change to my motion. And it was seconded by Jimenez. Yeah. So is that all right with the all right, we got that straight now. All right. Okay. Uh, uh, just <laughs> that's why I was asking. Um, wasn't this all part of Council Member Carrasco's substitute motion? This this is still my motion. Well, okay, so Council Member uh, Carrasco, you made a substitute motion on Council Member Cohen's yep. motion that was bifurcated. So it was, there were two pieces to it. And so I assumed that you were making a substitute motion to the second piece, which was 
basically everything else besides rank free floating. So, so this is the bifurcated motion. Right. And this is the motion that, uh, this was the part of the substitute motion that I made. So we're still voting, voting on it. I'm okay, voting so, it, I'm, I'm voting it down, but it's still my motion. Okay, so I need uh, either Nora or Tony to help me out on this one. So who, whose motion is it? Yeah. Is it, is it? I, I need attorney advice on this one. If the um, motion, if the substitute motion included this bifurcated piece, and I just don't recall, I'd have to go back and, and try to uh, uh, look at that, but it sounds like from Council Member Carrasco that was her intent, then this would be um, uh, a substitute motion. Yeah, all, all on my that notes, second yeah, piece. All my I, note it, says is to move um, her memo to rules along with approving the previous no. motion on the table. So that's, how, I, that's that that's the motion as it was being as it was evolving but when i when he wouldn't accept my motion i went ahead and if you recall i said mm -hmm. i'm making a substitute motion with everything that's been included in the previous motion so that included the bifurcated motion okay and then someone i don't know who the other council member was asked if i would move it to 2020 Four. Four. I said yes. Councilmember Esparza seconded that uh, that uh, friendly amendment. Okay. Well, that solves that then. And, and so that, that uh, Vice Mayor, that my cryptic notes that does appear to be what was in my cryptic notes also. Okay, <laughs> that doesn't settle it then. <laughs> so. Um, okay. Oh, Nora, so. Who, oh, so you said it does confirm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it I'm confirms sorry. it. I, I misunderstood you. Oh, I was that's great. Say vice mayor, it confirms <laughs> it. <laughs> I, heard, I heard her wrong. So, okay, we're good. We're all on the same page now. We all have a clear understanding. It's Councilmember Carrasco's motion. Can I ask for a clarification then? Uh, sure, Councilmember Frog. Seriously? So, uh, uh, <laughs> So now I'm, I'm asking Councilmember Carrasco. Then, in this case, um, I I just want to make it clear that what we're bringing back for 2024 is just a, a consideration of placing this on a ballot. That we're not actually voting today that it goes on the 2024 ballot. That that was it. If you can clarify that. That was my understanding that we were going to bring it back for discussion. I'm still not going to vote for it. Yeah, I just want to because I am going to okay, vote for it. Right. If that is if that is the if that is the, the clarification. So if that is, yeah. then then I'm good with. It. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that's a, the clarification that it would come back for discussion in 2024. Any other questions? Uh, hands raised. No. Uh, Tony. Jimenez. Yes. Morales. Yes. Cohen. Hi. Roscoe? No. Davis? No. Esparza? No. Arenas? Arena? No. No. Foley? No. Mahan? No. Jones? Motion, no. Motion fails three yes, seven no's. And I'll share the screen so the vote is visible. Yeah, that motion fails. Okay, motion fails. Uh, that is it, right? We're, we're done? Yes. Okay, well, this meeting is adjourned. Do we have, did we have open forum on the agenda? I, we don't I usually have We don't, we don't have open forum. We do. We do? Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. On the open forum. Okay, open forum needs to be items not already discussed on the agenda. This needs to be new items for the council, not items that were already discussed today. Um, Blair Beekman. Uh, 
Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks for the meeting today. Um, I guess a reminder, I, I have two minutes to speak that in my two minutes time, uh, just a, 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 a reminder of, of the importance of working towards uh, a future of peace in our communities and that our our, our measures are geared towards a, a full community uh, effort. How, how I, think, I think it's creating a community effort, a full community effort with uh, public oversight and, and, and such that creates a future of sustainability in, in much better terms that uh, I think is a promise of an interesting future for ourselves. So good luck in those efforts. Uh, and how we're trying to define sustainability at this time. And uh, I think it's through the open democratic process. And uh, we tried to do that a bit today. I, I hope that there was 15 measures that we can uh, better talk about in the upcoming future. And another issue, I hope uh, this can be a time now that we're going through this part of the process that we can eventually be talking about um, a, a racial equity special study session coming up soon. We talked about it often. There were a few study sessions we were talking about in March that didn't happen, that could have, that I hope can <laughs> now soon. And uh, good luck how we can do that. It was mentioned here a few times that we don't talk clearly enough about racial equity yet, and we're trying to learn how to. Uh, some, so, some few more open study sessions that were canceled in March. Good luck how we can do that uh, in the upcoming months. Thank you. Yes, thanks. I wanted to um, reiterate what Blair Beekman just said in that uh, a, an ideas of peace and that we would have that going forward. And as we are facing every day on our television and media that is being covered is the war in, um, in Ukraine. And what we're seeing that in that war is the, it, this is wars for fuel, for oil and gas. And this is where the changes that we need to make as a, as a species for our survival, literally, as we see the death and mayhem that's going on over oil and gas in, in Ukraine by Russia, that we need to be changing and to get off of fossil fuels completely. And this is what Europe is being faced with. We all have blood on our hands from what's happening there because we're all addicted to fossil fuels. And this is the change that we need to have. And we're seeing it you know, seeing it in the most grotesque um, realities of, of, of death and mayhem of, of Russia towards Ukraine. And so, and the, and the dislocation of 4 million people that is going to create the, these are, these are climate refugees really, because it is over oil and gas that we're fighting about. And, oh, that's the main thing that they say. We are fueling the Russian military, $1 billion a day is being fueled. That's how much he makes, in, in Putin makes. And so that's what's fueling his war machine. So we do all have blood on our hands for being addicted to fossil fuels. And so what going forward, it's really, sustainability is a, is a weaker word. It's really survival is what the, my husband is saying today about the climate crisis, is that it's survival. It's not sustainability. It's food, clothing, and shelter. And that's what we have to focus on going forward. It is our, our basic needs and for the people and to be free of fossil fuels. Back to the chair. Thank you, Tony. Meeting is adjourned.